it's eclipse day. Welcome to Time's Great American Solar Eclipse Show. Imagine a scene of unparalleled beauty. The moon completely blocks the sun, daytime becomes a deep twilight, and the sun's corona shimmers in the darkened sky. Well, the wait is over. Today is the big day. It's going to be a nationwide totality party. Thanks for choosing to spend it with us. I'm Amy Shira Title. Normally, you can catch me at my YouTube channel, Vintage Space, where I fondly look back at all the intricacies and unknown side stories from man's journey to the moon. Should the United States have been completely blindsided by the launch of Sputnik? Why is it that the Gemini launches look nothing like any of the other launches we're used to seeing? What changes did NASA make to avoid a repeat of Apollo 13's near-fatal disaster? How did these two spacecraft actually dock up to become this one spacecraft? How did NASA get pictures of Neil Armstrong walking down the lunar module's ladder if there was nobody already on the moon to operate the camera? That's what we're talking about today on Vintage Space. You get the idea, but enough about my day job. Think of me today as your time tour guide, offering a front row seat to the phenomena we've dubbed the Great American Solar Eclipse. During this unmatched three hour window of eclipse coverage, I'll be joined by Time Senior Editor Jeffrey Kluger, Time for Kids reporter Caroline Curran, former NASA astronaut Marsha Ivins, NASA Ambassador Charles Fulco, and we'll even hear from the late Carl Sagan's wife and co-creator of the Cosmos television series, Anne Druyan. Most important, we'll be counting counting down to totality in Oregon, Wyoming, and Charleston, and take you live around the country as the path of totality moves from city to city. And be sure to check out our 360 live stream of the eclipse in Casper, Wyoming by clicking the link in the description or visiting time.com slash 360 eclipse. And if you're watching on YouTube, you can cl click the info card right here. All of that's to come. First, let's take a look at what makes today's eclipse so special. It's been 99 years since a total solar eclipse crossed the U.S. from sea to shining sea. It was on June 8, 1918, that a solar eclipse blazed a trail from Washington to Florida, making today's coast-to-coast -to -coast phenomena something truly rare and special. There was another eclipse in 1991, but totality was only visible in Baja, California. The total eclipse path swept over Hawaii, where many Americans flew to catch a glimpse of totality. But sadly, weather conditions were unfavorable, making the California-Mexico border the only place in North America to view this miraculous event. In fact, if you were lucky enough to be in Baja, you glimpsed totality for more than six minutes. So just what is an eclipse? A solar eclipse is like a celestial bullseye. The sun, moon, and earth all align such that the moon blocks the sun from our earthly perspective. If the sun is partially blocked, it's a partial eclipse. Depending on how far the moon is from the earth, we might get an annular eclipse. But a total eclipse is rare. This is when the moon perfectly blocks the sun, revealing the atmosphere, the solar corona. Here's a little intro as to why these eclipses are so rare. Total solar eclipses occur when the moon passes directly between the Earth and the sun, blocking solar light. They're exceedingly rare. The last one to touch the U.S. was in 1979. On average, they happen where you live once every 375 years. The sun is about 400 times larger than the moon, but the sun is also 400 times farther away, so the two bodies appear about the same size to us on Earth. The moon orbits the Earth once each month, so why doesn't the moon's shadow touch the Earth, causing an eclipse with each pass? Partly because the moon's orbit is tilted slightly, which causes its shadow to miss the Earth most of the time. Another reason is that the moon's orbit is elliptical. For much of its orbit, the moon is farther away from Earth and appears too small to block out the sun completely. Those eclipses are called annular. Only when the eclipse occurs at the moon's closest approach is a visible total eclipse possible. Even then, the narrow band of totality usually tracks over water or away from population centers. That's why this total solar eclipse is so special. As it cuts a path of darkness across the U.S. this August 21st, it could be the most viewed total eclipse in history, and for many, the experience of a lifetime. Okay, now that that explanation is out of the way, let's send things over to Time for Kids reporter Caroline Curran, who's in Time's Studio B with NASA Solar System Ambassador Charles Fulco. They're ready to give you a celestial vocabulary primer. Listen up, this could come in handy for trivia someday. 
Hi, I'm Time for Kids Kid reporter Carolyn Curran. Today I'm joined by Charles Foucault, NASA's Solar Eclipse Educator. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks so much for having me, Caroline. So we at Time for Kids are calling this the Great American Solar Eclipse. What does the word solar mean? Well, Caroline, solar simply means pertaining to the sun. A solar eclipse means the sun is being covered by the moon for an observer on the Earth. So I can demonstrate this by taking the Earth and the moon, and you can see that there's a shadow being produced on the Earth from the moon. That's a solar eclipse. And the moon produces two types of shadows. It produces a darker inner shadow called the umbra, and that's where you'd want to see totality from. It also produces the much bigger, lighter outer shadow called the penumbra, and that's where most people will see a partial eclipse. A lunar eclipse means uh, about the moon. So two weeks after a solar eclipse, the moon travels in its orbit to the other side of the Earth, where it could go into the Earth's shadow. So what do we call the flux of lights that appear behind the umbra or penumbra? Well, Caroline, as an eclipse becomes total, you get some strange things happening that you only see during a total eclipse, and this is one of them. Come over to the word with me and I'll explain. So the moon tra is traveling about 2,000 miles an hour, and on an eclipse day, it'll start off with a little tiny notch in the sun. Eventually, about 30 minutes into the eclipse, you're gonna have a sun that looks like this. So the moon takes about an hour to cover the sun, so as the moon keeps going over the sun, more and more of it disappears as the moon begins to slide over the sun and completely cover it, you get what's called Bailey's beads. Now the moon's surface, you know, has mountains on it. So the mountains actually jut into the sun's disk and they block part of the sun's thin crescent. And it only lasts for about maybe five or 10 seconds. But the last Bailey's bead to remain, that was given the name the diamond ring effect because it's just this one glorious, beautiful piece of light surrounding the darkened new moon as the new moon begins to appear. So within about a span of 30 seconds, you go from a sliver sun to Bailey's beads to a diamond ring and finally to totality. And that's when the sun's corona comes into view. The corona is the outer atmosphere of the sun that's only visible during totality. It's actually made of hot gases that surround the sun. Caroline, you've never seen anything so beautiful as a corona at a total eclipse of the sun. Thanks guys. A total solar eclipse is certainly special, and finding oneself in its path could be a once in a lifetime opportunity. So let's take a look at today's path of totality. Carbondale, Illinois, Nashville, Tennessee, Charleston, South Carolina, these are just a few of the celestial way stations for today's solar eclipse. Let's take a live look on the first stop on the way to totality. It's the start of the partial phase in Salem, Oregon. The moon's shadow will traverse the entire state of Oregon in just 12 minutes, and residents of the Beaver State best enjoy the view. A total solar eclipse passing over Oregon won't happen again for nearly 100 years. And like I said, Salem is just the beginning. We at Time have decided to make Casper, Wyoming ground zero for today's coverage of the Great American Eclipse. In fact, Casper offers eclipse watchers an 88% chance of viewing totality with absolute clarity. So let's take a closer look at Casper. of about 60,000 people and it's mainly known for its oil and coal industry and the eclipse forecast for anyone out there is partly cloudy so that makes it pretty good viewing and fun little strange fact Wyoming actually only has two escalators in the state and both of them are in Casper let's go there now and join time senior editor and author of numerous books including the recent Apollo 8 the thrilling story of the first mission to the moon Jeffrey Kluger He's our very own Eclipse ground control today. And along with Jeffrey, we've got five-time space shuttle astronaut Marsha Ivins. She's also on the ground there in Casper. Jeff, we're about 10 minutes away from the partial eclipse beginning in Casper. What's it like on the ground there? It's uh, exciting and buzzy on the ground here right now. We've got, well, it's hard to estimate how many people we have at the event center here. 
but there are hundreds of people who have been camping out here on this particular spot since sunup this morning. Uh, but uh, at the moment, the weather is perfect. It's 72 degrees, the clouds are gone, the sky is clear, it's perfect eclipse viewing weather, but that wasn't the case last night. Last night we had the experience that is known as a microburst. And a microburst I had never seen before, but it sounds like exactly what it is. Microbursts occur when there is a thunderstorm, sometimes at a high enough elevation that the precipitation doesn't actually reach the ground. In the thunderstorm though, you get very dry air, and the air is very dry here. That causes the water and the ice and the clouds to evaporate, which causes the air to cool. And when you get cool air, it drops out of the bottom of that cloud at about 60 miles an hour and hits the ground at 100 miles an hour. So what you're seeing, or what you should be seeing on camera right now, was the immediate devastation of our time site here that played out last night. Uh, I hope you're seeing that. Amy, are you getting that on camera? Oh, there, now we're getting it. Oh, wow. Yeah, that does not yeah, look this like was, what you want to see when you're out there for an eclipse. Yeah, the frightened looking guy in white holding up the tents is, uh, that's me. Marsha, you were here to experience that. What was your reaction to it? My first reaction was to grab whatever was flying by me. My second was to, to notice and admire the camera guys, being camera guys, who immediately threw their body over the hardware so that nothing was damaged, so, so that I didn't have to. It reminded me of the scene in The Martian when Mark Watney's potato crop got destroyed, <laughs> but at least we had a whole set of food here that we were fine with. And we're going to now, we want to cut now to a time-lapse, uh, uh, a time lapse loops that we set up on Saturday afternoon. We arrived here at about 5 p.m. and began setting up our Time Media Center. And what you're going to see here is about three hours of work uh, to get this system up and running. And it is the, uh, the time encampment that was later, later blown away. That's that's wild. Oh, was anyone hurt is the real question I have. The first thing that comes to mind was any gear damaged or anyone hurt? There was no one hurt. We did have to uh, shout out to uh, some passers-by uh, who were in the path of an airborne tent, and happily they, uh, they ducked out of the way at the last minute, and happily we are all well insured. All right, so now that all the scary weather has passed, what's everything like down there? Jeff, you said it was kind of buzzing. Is it, uh, what's the mood down there? And maybe Marsha, I mean, you've, you know, gone to space how like do you feel like there's the similar kind of like excitement around a launch like are people that level of just gearing up to see something amazing in space Marcia, this is uh, Amy is asking us uh, when we have this kind of anticipation of a big event playing out this is a little bit like a shuttle launch although there's no such thing as scrubbing an eclipse so how does the tension here the excitement here the anticipation here compare to launch morning well, I was impressed that when I arrived, I was handed a 20-page checklist that had a very specific, almost minute-by-minute -minute timeline, which is exactly what happens when you go to space. You know, in the, the beginning of the partial eclipse and the, the full eclipse, it's all minute-by-minute, minute, which is, in fact, what the crew on board the station is going to be seeing, you know, as they try to do the same thing and capture the view across the ground. So I felt right at home. And the one thing that is impressive here is that there is no such thing as a, as a scrub. There's no such thing as saying, sorry, we ran out of funding. The eclipse can happen today. This will happen on time, on schedule. It is the cosmic wheels of the solar system that are controlling today's events. That's, yeah, that's a great way to put it. And that's so exciting. Marsha, did you ever see an eclipse from space? Did you ever see an eclipse from space, Amy wants to know? I did not see an eclipse for, from space. There have been astronauts who have seen eclipses from space, and those pictures are available. Um, but just like we have to be in the right place at the right time, on the right part of the Earth, um, so does the crew on orbit, whether it's a shuttle or a station, to see the eclipse shadow across the Earth. And that's, it's an interesting uh, disparity between an eclipse viewed from space and an yeah. eclipse viewed from Earth. Because viewed from Earth, it's a magnificent experience. It's a transformative experience. What's it look like to see an eclipse when you're in space? Well, from looking at the pictures, here on the Earth, we're on the receiving end. 
Right. And to see it from space, you're almost seeing it from the transmitting end, right. you know, from the delivery end, because you see the shadow, um, sort of like the the cartoon reenactments of you know what the eclipse is going to be. You see a dark spot across the Earth and sort of a gray fuzzy part around it, particularly if it's highlighted by clouds. So it's like being behind the camera to watch it. Right. And the eclipse, by the way, will move across the country. It's going to begin at Oregon and end at uh, South Carolina. And it'll be moving across the country at a speed of about 1,500 miles per hour. So this is uh, the sun moving across, or the shadow of the moon, uh, moving across the United States three times faster than a commercial aircraft carrier comes over. So it is a zippy experience, and it's going to be captured all along the path of totality. Absolutely wild. Well, that's, yeah, an amazing perspective, too, to think about it from space. But let's take another look at that insane footage of your guys' tent being almost destroyed by weather that kind of threatened things last night. Everybody's in the media groups hanging on. We got another high wind event coming down first got blowing dust coming over the airport now we got blowing dust this is a not quite a habu but almost we got bergen kind of a downburst coming in on the north side of casper up on the ridge line here this is the airport we got blowing dust now here comes the gust everybody's trying to hang on to the media tents here we go uh-oh you guys lock here we go uh-oh uh -oh. it's breaking uh -oh. it's breaking uh-oh hang on it's breaking i've got it i got it this 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 this, this top is broke here. So this, hang on. Hang on, guys. It's a snap. Hang on. Oh God. Wow. Blowing dust across Casper City. We're trying to hang on to the tents here at the media camp here at Casper. That is absolutely wild. All right, Jeff, I see now that you are joined with a photographer who is going to tell us a little bit about how you actually photograph an eclipse. I'm dying to hear this. Yeah, I am here with uh, Antoine Ribot. He is the rare man who can claim the title of astronomer and gastronomer. And I can tell you the breakfasts, lunches, and lunches and dinners this man has been preparing for us for the last three days have been magnificent. I'm going to see if he has a spare room in his house. I'm never leaving. But Antoine is here today in his capacity as a an astronomer and a space photographer. And Antoine, you were telling me earlier some great stories about how you got started growing up in Paris with your fascination with all things astronomical. Can you tell me a little about that? Sure, thank you, Jeff. Uh, well, I was in Paris, I was maybe eight years old, and my dad offered me Le Petit Astronome, which is a little astronomer kit, which is a little plastic telescope, basically. And I was in Gare Montparnasse on the 13th floor, and I could see the planet Venus, which is, you know, the shepherd star. The, and um, I was blown away. And since that day, I think I just went to um, space camp, like you know, science camp, and I learned more and more about stars and about photography. Back then it was film and not digital. Right, right. And uh, as I recall, early in your career, that was about, you were about eight years old, and at 10 years old, you made a discovery that changed the history of astronomy, or at least you thought you did. Talk yes. About that. I was in the south of France, uh, where Van Gogh uh, painted the Starry Night uh, near Saint Remy de Provence. And I remember it was 4 a.m., and I looked at this, what I thought was a new sun with planets orbiting it. And I was blown away. I woke up my dad and I said, Come, come see that. And and I realized, well, at first I needed to contact the um, International Astronomy Association of and course. I needed to make that discovery known, but I realized it was Jupiter. And it was the first time I saw Jupiter because in Paris, it's kind of limited. Yeah, well, and in fairness, Galileo did get that about 400 years earlier, but still, no slur on you to rediscover it is great. Thank you, Jeff. Um, so your, tell me a little bit about how you do your photographic work, because you live in New York now. Correct. And New York is about the most light polluted place on the planet. So how does a New York photographer who loves space find a, the time and find the position to shoot? And then how do you enhance those pictures you get? 
Well, I have to either drive or fly away from the light pollution. That's a big problem. And basically, I, I'm going to t either Texas or star parties, and I'm just, uh, just taking beautiful photos. And then I spent a few hours to enhance the details. And uh, one last question, how will you be shooting today? What will your techniques be today? Uh, today is simply uh, live broadcast uh, directly fed to the satellite using my uh, HD camera. So I'm going to just follow the, the moon and uh, hopefully the corona, beautiful corona today. It's going to be gorgeous. Thank you, Jeff. And back to New York, uh, back to you, Amy, uh, and we will keep uh, holding things down here. Awesome. Thanks, Jeff. Well, Jeff and our time photographers have done an amazing job preparing for the big moment of totality in Casper. If totality happens near you, you too can capture great photos of the phenomena. Here's a quick look at how to get that perfect shot. I'm Lisa Edichico, a technology correspondent with Time, and I'm here with Ken Sklut, a Canon Explorer of Light, and he's going to share some tips on how to photograph the total solar eclipse that's coming up on August 21st. It's the first time in nearly four decades that this has happened in the U.S., so it's an extremely rare opportunity. First of all, Ken, would you like to kind of walk us through the equipment that you'll need to get started? Gladly. I brought three different level cameras with me. This is the PowerShot SX60, and Canon has bundled this with the solar filter that we need. The one next to it that we brought is the Rebel T7i. It's a little step up. And on the other side here, we've got kind of the, the pro side. We've got a 600 millimeter lens on our, our latest, our 5D Mark IV, and reaching out with these long lenses, we get a really nice sized sun disk. Is there any way to photograph this with a smartphone? I don't see that happening. The smartphones have very small lenses. We're hoping that people will move up to kind of a real camera with it being such a unique event. So you mentioned a solar filter before. Can you talk a little bit more about why it's so important to use one? The solar filter being on the lens protects both the camera and your vision. Now it's really important to keep it on the length of the uh, eclipse and we'll be taking it off just for totality. The moon at a certain point is gonna step right in front of the sun and it's gonna produce a diamond ring, just that little glisten in one of the corners. Once that disappears, then that's safe that you can take the solar filter off because that's the beginning of totality. That totality is gonna to last anywhere from two minutes to two minutes and 42 seconds. Ken, would you mind walking us through just how to set up the shot and how to get the right angle and the right exposure? Very happy to do that. Mount the camera to the tripod. In this case, turn the camera back up toward the angle of the sun that I'm hoping to photograph it at. Once you put a camera on a tripod, you want to make sure that you turn off the image stabilization. So we don't want the camera vibrating on a tripod. I'm also going to take off autofocus. I'm going to focus at the point that I want to, but I don't want it to stay on. The next thing I'd want to do is adjust my screen that I don't have to get down below the camera now to look up. Next, I want to make sure that I'm on the right mode, and that mode is going to be manual. Whatever lens you're going to be using, we want to make sure that that lens is to the fullest extension. I have some tape that I want to make sure that I put on here as a lens is tilted up and gravity is pulling it back down. We want to prevent that from happening. I'm going to place the solar filter right on the lens, a simple little screw in, so it sits right there. I would align the sun where it's going to be and make sure that I have that right in the center because that's the best part of the optics. And from this point, I'm ready to make some exposure. Well, since I don't get to actually see the eclipse, this is the closest I'm going to get to my own eclipse selfie. So pretend it's fun. <laughs> Jeff, we all know that you and Marsha are outstanding in your fields, but today you really are um, outstanding in the field. Um, th there are a massive number of people out there with you, people who have traveled to get a look at this amazing eclipse. The big one, if you will, the rough estimate of how many sky watchers how many people have actually descended on Casper to join you and see it live in the field? 
That's a very good question, and it has a movable answer because the number changes all the time. Uh, Casper begins with a base population of just under 60,000 people, but Marsha has been talking to the event coordinator and has got some numbers about what they're seeing over the last few days. Marsha? They, um, they do the recording of how many people come into Casper at the end of the day, so we don't know how many people arrived just today. Yesterday, they had 231,000 uh, cars come into Casper, and the day before, they had 117. So they have seriously swelled the population here in Casper, but we have seen nothing that hasn't been calm and peaceful and just like a Sunday picnic in your backyard. The largest Sunday picnic the largest in the Sunday history picnic. of your backyard, however. Um, and we do know that also among people who are here to stay, there have been about 30,000 hotel rooms booked, which uh, doesn't sound like a huge number if you're talking about Mexico City or Paris. But in fact, that's about 50% again, the population of Casper. So that's a very big number. Now, we also caught up yesterday with an interesting group of friends. Uh, there's an international or a national amateur astronomy organization called Citizen Kate, and they are going to have 70 different sets of astronomers entirely across the path of totality, uh, helping to study the corona in the entire arc that the eclipse is making across the US. We caught up with Mike Pierce yesterday, who's the head of the Wyoming branch of Citizen Kate, and we talked to Mike about his work, and we talked to Mike about the science, but what touched us most was the fact that Mike was here with a couple of friends, and Mike and his friends have a bit of history with an eclipse. And I think we have uh, some video footage of a conversation we had yesterday that we can run here. Thanks, Amy. I'm here still with uh, Mike Pierce and also two of Mike's friends, Bill Klepping and Kevin Cobble. And something special about these three guys, these three very old friends, is that they were together for the eclipse in 1979. And here they have gathered again 38 years later to share this eclipse. Where were you guys in 79 when you saw that one? Oh, boy. We were, uh, we were north of Billings, Montana. Right. Right. We had spent the night in Billings, which was, I think, in the 99 percentile point. And so we got up real early that morning. And, zipped up north and to the, towards the center line. Yeah. So our exclusive reporting reveals that there will be another one in the United States in 2024. It goes yeah. right over my house. house. All right, so will you guys so be together we'll again? we'll be back together yes. again yes. at uh, Bill's house. Uh, well, probably <laughs> Kevin. I have 100% tree cover, probably Kevin's house. All right. All right. Well, you know what? I think everyone here will be at Kevin's house in 2024, right. so like to give them your address. Uh, yes. <laughs> it's it's, it's, it's $2,000 for, uh, for <laughs> We'll oh, see what the rates are. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Now, now, something we need to mention, though, at the last eclipse that happened was um, we, we, of course, had a lot of cameras, and I was supposed to run a certain amount of cameras. The last minute, I had to make a run with another guy in case we got clouded out, and so Bill, at the last minute, had to run the cameras. <laughs> And, and at, at the end of the clip, we had a we had a video or a uh, audio recording going. And we hear somebody go, "Bill, was 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 this on during the eclipse?" And, and the lens cap was still on. Oh, no. <laughs> so I don't know if Bill knows it or not, but this this is the camera and the lens and the lens cap. So I'm going to shoot so a whole roll. We'll with let him the, use it, but we took the film out. You'll so notice it's, 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 it's no it, problem. It, it, it's not a through the lens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and and they <laughs> set it, they problem. set it up and said. Here, just push the button and say and and tell me the count. Yeah. And I just did what they told me to. All right, I'm sure it'll go better for this eclipse. Oh I think yeah. It will. It, oh, definitely. We're ready for this one. Right. Excellent. All right. Thank you for your time, guys. And Thank you. Thank back you to you in New York, Amy. All right. Well, Jeff, I hear you've got. Um, I understand that you've caught up with some of the uh, the traveling faithful earlier. I'm sorry, I, I missed that. Some of the, uh, some of the what? Sorry, I just, I understand that you've caught up with some of the people who've been traveling into Casper. Have you met any interesting people or, or heard any interesting stories about the people who've made it, made the journey that far out to see the eclipse? 
Well, what we've seen, which really impressed us, in downtown Casper, there are two large uh, global maps displayed, one of the U.S., Western Hemisphere, Eastern Hemisphere, and they are filled with thousands of pins, and each pin represents the home state or home country of somebody who has come here for this eclipse. And if you see this map, uh, I've posted it on my social media feed. I think a lot of folks have it up. It is a thickening bristle of pins, which gives you a sense of how many people across the world have come to Casper, Wyoming to share this experience. But what we just showed you about the um, the four fellows who experienced the eclipse uh, in 1979, that's just a little bit of eclipse history. Eclipses have been with us, of course, for millions, billions of years. Uh, uh, human beings uh, experience in eclipses, of course, is a somewhat newer phenomenon. And I think we have a video package teed up that will give you a sense of how eclipses have been viewed with fear, with wonder, with superstition, and with joy. Uh, over the last several thousand years. Let's see if we can roll that package. I love you more now than ever. We have, oops, sorry, come here. All right, so as you can see, we have a live view of the eclipse. It is just starting to happen in Casper, right, Wyoming. We've got about a little over an hour, an hour and 10 minutes to totality. So definitely stay with us. It's going to be incredible. And as you can see, uh, speaking to Jeff in the field, this eclipse is reconnecting those who have a history with one another. But historically speaking, how have our view of eclipses changed over the years? Well, here's a quick look. To witness a total solar eclipse is to experience fear, at least a little. Most people wouldn't admit that. We're 21st century humans, after all, and we know that an eclipse is a completely harmless thing. That doesn't mean, however, that the tens of millions of people who witnessed the great American eclipse on August 21st won't be a little spooked all the same. All of us operate on neurological software that was written when we were proto-humans living on the savannas. And to the more primitive part of our brains, there's something deeply unsettling about the sight of an eclipse. The sky darkens, which it does every day, but to a shade of blue and then black and blue that occurs at no other time. Throughout history, human affairs have been shaped by the suddenness and eeriness of a solar eclipse. The Lydians and the Medes ended their war in 585 BC when a total eclipse darkened the sky and convinced the combatants that it was a sign of disapproval over the ongoing fighting. The English saw an unhappy cause and effect between the eclipse of August 2nd, 1133 and the death of King Henry I, even though Henry died more than two years later. In the Odyssey, Homer recounted the eclipse of 1177 BC, writing, and the sun has perished out of heaven and an evil mist hovers over all. Over time, of course, humans became less superstitious and more scientific, and an eclipse became not an occasion for fear, but an opportunity to learn. During the total eclipse of August 18, 1868, French astronomer Jules Janssen studied the prominences, the flames and flares that dance around the edges of the sun's blacked out disk. Looking through a spectroscopic prism, he saw the signature of helium, thus discovering the second lightest element in the universe, even before it had been found on Earth. 
Much more significantly, on May 29, 1919, British astronomer Arthur Eddington used a total eclipse to prove one of the premises of Einstein's general theory of relativity, that gravity will bend light by a predictable amount. Months before the event, Eddington measured the precise position of the Hyades star cluster. Then, on May 29, when the sun was blacked out and the stars popped into view, he measured it again, and it was different by a factor perfectly consistent with the bending Einstein had predicted in his 1915 theory. The Times of London announced the discovery with the headline, Revolution in Science, New Theory of the Universe, Newtonian Ideas Overthrown. That, in some ways, illustrates one more gift of the solar eclipse, that it allows for two different kinds of vision, the aesthetic and the insightful, the glimpse of beauty and the glimpse of the working of the cosmos itself. We'll be returning to Casper before totality, but while we wait for the sun and the moon to line up perfectly in Wyoming, let's go back to Time Studio B for more from Time for Kids reporter Caroline Curran and NASA Solar System Ambassador Charles Fulco. I'm Time for Kids kid reporter Caroline Curran. Today I'm joined by Charles Fulco, NASA Solar Eclipse Educator. Thank you for joining us today. And thanks for having me here, Caroline. So we all know you're not supposed to look directly at the sun even when the moon is in front of it. So how do you enjoy the solar eclipse safely? I'm going to show you and the folks at home how to make a solar viewer out of very simple materials you can either purchase or you probably have around the house. A little bit of foil a hobby knife, which uh, some kids may want to have their parents help them with, a dry erase or a permanent marker, and this is a tool called an awl, and this is used specifically to make holes in things. A little bit of tape, and of course, your very own safety goggles. You're, so you're going to turn a regular old shipping tube that you could pick up at a postal center into a solar viewer. And what I like about the solar viewer is you don't even look in the direction of the sun, so there's no chance of anyone hurting their eyes. So here's a plain shipping tube. We're going to put a hole in the front of this first. And you don't want to make it a very large hole because the larger the hole, the fuzzier the image. So let's take a hobby knife, put your goggles on. Give it a pop. Good. The rougher your, your edge is, the, the worse the image is going to look. So what we do is we put foil over it to smooth out the image. So take some of the tape. I'm going to put the foil here. Now tape the bottom, and then tape the side here and the top. So when you put a hole through the foil, which you're going to do now, you're going to see what a nice, smooth, round hole you're going to get. Put it straight through and pull it right back out. Good. Now we're going to go cut a window out in the side, and the viewing window is going to let you look into the tube to see the image of the sun formed at the rear of the tube. So let's take the knife again and just cut along those dotted lines and make yourself a nice little rectangle there. Now you are all ready to view the sun. If it were a nice sunny day outside, you'd put this over your shoulder. And you want to put the front of the tube that lets the light in facing the sun to make sure it's aimed at the sun without looking at it. You want to watch for the shadow on the ground. So it should look like a perfect triangle on the ground. As you do that, also look inside and you should see a bright white image of the sun suddenly appear at the very end of the tube right here. This is the best and safest way to view a partial eclipse of the sun without hurting your eyes. Well, thank you so much. You're welcome.
So as you guys can see, we have a live shot of the sun as seen from our Ground Zero in Casper, Wyoming on the screen here. And we're going to try to show you this view as much as possible so that you can actually see the moon slowly covering the sun. It's such a neat thing to watch happening over time. Even if it moves slowly enough, you sort of don't see it happening, but you'll realize like, oh my gosh, now half the sun is gone. Um, it's super neat. This is also great for those of you who can't make it to a site of totality or have been rained out from watching it. Um, or those who don't have time or didn't have time like I didn't to make a solar viewer um, because as we know viewing a solar eclipse safely is super important but I think the only thing that might be cooler than watching an eclipse from the earth would be to actually watch one from space so here's Jeffrey Kluger with a look at some eclipses you have probably never laid eyes on because odds are unless you are an astronaut you were not in space when they happened It's a particular bit of human vanity to feel as if total solar eclipses are staged for our benefit. They're utterly lovely, wonderfully eerie, and when the sky show begins, the seating is free. But eclipses are hardly just earthly phenomena. They happen everywhere in the cosmos, literally every second of any day. All an eclipse is, after all, is one cosmic body moving in front of another one. As the Earth orbits the Sun, it's always eclipsing some part of it, as are all of the other planets orbiting all of the other stars. Consider the moment on June 5, 2012, for example, when the planet Venus made a six-hour transit across the face of the Sun. Venus is about the same diameter as Earth, but in this image, captured by NASA's Solar Dynamics Observatory, it appears no bigger than a dot. The next time Earth and Venus will be in the right position for us to witness another such eclipse won't come until 2117. Even when the transit ended, the spectacle was not over. The spacecraft kept watching as Venus passed the solar disk and moved in front of the sun's corona, the blazing veil of plasma that reaches millions of miles into space. The much more familiar solar eclipse with our moon blocking the light from the sun is always observed from the ground. In 2003, the Earth Observatory satellite watched the Antarctic as an eclipse unfolded, capturing the shadow it cast on the ice. The long oval-shaped shadow, which measured more than 300 miles, is similar to the ones that are cast in the northern hemisphere during an August dawn. Not all solar eclipses are total. That's partly because the orbit of the moon is elliptical, and when it's farther away from Earth, the lunar disk appears slightly smaller, too small to cover the solar disk fully. These so-called annular eclipses are still too bright to see with the human eye, but the eye of Japan's Hinode satellite is not human, and it captured a dramatic image of a particularly striking annular eclipse. Perhaps the most spectacular eclipse viewing of all occurred in November of 1969, when the Apollo 12 astronauts were on their way back to Earth after landing on the moon. During their homeward coast, they pointed their 16 millimeter camera out the window and captured a first ever image of the Earth eclipsing the sun. The universe might be insensible to its beauty, but at least one known species isn't. That Apollo 12 eclipse shot might be my favorite shot from space of all time. Favorite mission, such an amazing eclipse to see. I mean, to see a full solar eclipse from between the Earth and the moon, I mean, that's just wild. Absolutely, absolutely love that shot. Great mission. <laughs> all right, and for those of you who are not in space, who are not between the Earth and the moon watching an eclipse, don't forget to check out our 360 stream from the eclipse in Casper, Wyoming by clicking the link in the description or visiting time.com slash 360 eclipse. And if you're watching us right now on YouTube, you can click the info card right up here. 
So we are just about an hour, just under an hour away from totality in Casper, Wyoming. So I think now let's rejoin Jeffrey Kluger on the ground there, along with our resident American hero who has logged more than 1,300 hours in space, five-time shuttle astronaut Marsha Ivins. Thank you, Amy. Uh, Marsha, you again have a perspective that none of us have. Every time you orbited the Earth, by definition, you eclipsed the sun. So what was that experience like, to be able to see the sun come and go once every 90 minutes, and also to see the sun without the interfering blanket of the atmosphere? Well, the sun looks, I mean, we're no closer to it at 250 miles than we hear we are here on the ground, and so the sun looks pretty much the same. It's everything around the sun that looks so much sharper and so much clearer, the black of space. There are no shades of gray, really. And I was thinking, prior to coming here, since I have never seen an eclipse in space, how I might feel seeing an eclipse. We see the sun rise and set 16 times a day. That's extraordinary. We're traveling in a spacecraft at 17,500 miles per hour, and we're attaching to another spacecraft at the same speed. That's extraordinary. How is an eclipse any more extraordinary than that? So I spoke to two astronauts who have actually been in orbit witnessing the eclipse, and I asked them that question, and they both said the same thing. It's because it is so rare, it is the next level of extraordinary to see. And both of them have done imaging of it from space. And the astronauts were Don... Don Pettit Pettit. and Terry Virts. And they are, Terry Virts has actually has recently released a book of some of his great photography work. And that seems to be something about space, that you were on the other side of the camera quite a bit, on the taking side of the camera. It seems that a lot of astronauts become lay photographers. Why is that? Is there a sense of mission, I must bring these images back? No, when you, when you look out at the scene outside your window, it is what it is. When you look at the scene outside our window, it is like nothing you have seen before. And you cannot, it's almost a reflex, you cannot not take a picture. So people pick up the camera and they start to shoot. And then there are sunrises and then there are sunsets and then there are beautiful parts of the earth that you think, wait, I I know what that is. And and off it goes. And then there's the night lights and then there's the aurora. And so you can't stop is the problem. Do you ever get tired of it? Do you ever say, I have seen enough earth from 250 miles? It's not possible. Don Pettit, who has flown twice on space station missions, so he's had two very long increment flights, is itching to go back because it's not enough. There's still more out there to shoot. I think I would not be able to turn my camera (laughs) off. Okay, uh, we're going to throw back to Amy in New York, and we are getting a little bit closer now to the period of totality. All right. Let's take another look at what the sun is looking like live right now from Casper. So we can see the moon is covering about, I don't know, what is that, about a third or a little over a quarter of the sun. So it's really starting to, you're starting to really be able to see the curvature is really obviously beautiful. You're starting to really see how this is actually just going to slide and fit so beautifully and so perfectly over the sun, which is, of course, why this is a total eclipse, not a partial, not an annular. Um, And for those of you who are in the path of totality, you're watching us, um, and aren't in the path of the eclipse at all over North America, this is similar to the view that some states will get and and even parts of Canada might get, um, depending on how far you are from the path of totality. So the path of totality, if you're right in the center, that's where you see the moon perfectly covering the sun, and that's where it's just that beautiful, we we saw uh, Bailey's beads and the diamond and ring effect, that's where you see that. If you're not in totality, then ultimately what you will see is just this kind of partial sun covering. And of course, it won't kind of do the, I don't have models, <laughs> it won't kind of do the slide over this way. It'll kind of slide over, kind of kind of come at an angle and not cover all of it the whole way. That's, yeah. So it's a really, it's a really interesting way. You see multi, multiple different uh, types of eclipses sort of almost on the same day, even though it is technically speaking, a total eclipse. But for a totally different view, let's go check out the scene and see what's happening in Salem, Oregon. So here is what the eclipse is looking like. So you can see um, it's to, it's half an hour to totality in Salem versus uh, well, we were at 58 minutes um, in Casper. So the sun is covering a lot more of, or sorry, the moon is covering a lot more of the sun right now. I mean, this you can kind of think of it, this almost looks like the crescent moon that you draw in in kids' storybooks. And, you know, uh, it's, 
it's wild to see the sun looking like this. We never see a crescent sun. Um, so this is what this is what residents in Salem or people who've traveled to Salem um, are currently seeing. So it's it's getting there. It's moving quite quickly. And if you if you kind of look at that. Um, you know, quarter covered or a little over a third covered in um, in Casper, and then look versus at Salem. You can see how fast the the moon actually moves in just half an hour. This is covering. There's a great comparison of the two of them. That's a half hour or difference. I don't know exactly off the top of my head um, the distance between the two cities, but um, on the in in Casper we've got a little over a little under an hour, and in Salem we've got a little under half an hour. So the residents in Casper are going to be seeing the sun sliding. Or sorry. The, it really looks like the moon to me. <laughs> They're going to be seeing the sun passing, again, the moon passing in front of the sun and be getting that crescent shape um, in Casper before we actually get totality, before we actually get that full coverage, get that full Bailey's beads, the diamond ring effect and everything, all that beautiful thing. All right, so uh, Jeff, let's go back to Jeff and Marsha in Casper, speaking of Casper, and uh, get a little bit of an update on what's going on there. Jeff, do we have you? Yes, uh, we are here and we're seeing two things that are always the early signs of an eclipse totality approaching. First of all, a lot more people are wearing their glasses now to look up at the sun to see as that bite that the moon is taking out of it steadily grows. We are not yet at the point that it's affecting the level of ambient light here, but in short order, you're going to begin seeing the sky taking on a slightly different shade of blue from any other time we see the sun. The sky is always different shades of blue during the day, but it's a particular shade of blue when an eclipse is happening. So we're watching that progress unfold right now. And in the meantime, uh, I think, Amy, you've got a great package teed up on how astronomers throughout history and around the world for this one are looking at uh, eclipses. So back to you, Amy. I'm spaceflight historian Amy Shearer Title, and let me tell you, the upcoming total solar eclipse on August 21st is definitely a once-in-a-lifetime event not to be missed. And if you can't get anywhere to see it in person, why not tune in to Time's live stream coverage? We're going to be talking to people in the field, in the path of totality, and sharing their views. It's going to be an incredible event hosted by yours truly. And not only are eclipses just beautiful, cool things to see, they're also scientifically very important. In in fact, almost throughout most of human history, scientists have been using eclipses to study space and really understand the universe that we live in. Eclipses happen all the time. Technically speaking, an eclipse is just when one body in space is obscured by another body crossing in front of it. So they happen all the time, but what's rare is being in the right place at the right time to see it. Like a solar eclipse. The moon passes between the sun and the earth every month. That's what we see as a new moon. But it's rare that the three bodies actually line up so perfectly such that the moon obscures the sun from any given point on earth. Ancient civilizations knew this. They studied the sky the way some of us study our favorite TV programs. And that included eclipses. The earliest recorded sighting of a solar eclipse was by pre-Socratic philosopher Thales of Miletus. He predicted a total solar eclipse would happen sometime during the year 585 BCE, and he was right. It happened on May 28th of that year. Modern astronomers have worked backwards to confirm that yes, a total eclipse did happen where Thales would have seen it on that date. No one is entirely sure how Thales was able to predict that eclipse, but it's possible he had an understanding of two solar cycles that let him understand that it would be happening that year, the Saros cycle and the Exiligmos cycle. Another solar eclipse was seen by Plutarch on March 20th of the year 71. He wrote of the event that even when the moon covers the sun entirely, a kind of light is visible around the rim, which keeps the shadow from being profound and absolute. It's possible that his observations were the first time anyone in recorded history actually saw the solar corona. So ancient astronomers studied eclipses and they knew what was happening. They understood that it was the moon blocking the light of the sun. 
They had also studied the phases of the moon to understand that the Earth and the moon were both spherical, not flat. And interestingly, all of this still worked within the geocentric universe, the Aristotelian cosmos that had the Earth at the center with all of the planets orbiting around it. When we're talking about eclipses, it's easy to explain it whether the Earth is orbiting the Sun or whether the Sun is orbiting the Earth. It helped, too, that eclipses happen at relatively regular intervals. This all fit within Aristotle's model of the cosmos, wherein everything is perfect and unchanging. Of course, all of that fell apart with Copernicus in 1543, when he published in De Rev that the sun is actually the center of the solar system, not the Earth. In addition to decentering the Earth from our understanding of the cosmos, Copernicus was also a fan of eclipses. Copernicus used a pinhole camera to observe four partial eclipses in 1530, 1536, 1540, and 1541. Tycho Brahe also studied eclipses to try and measure the moon's diameter, as did his apprentice Johannes Kepler. Of course, using pinhole cameras, and even with Kepler's revelation that orbits are actually elliptical and not perfectly circular, their measurements of the moon's diameter were an estimation at best. Eclipse observations got more interesting in the 19th century when astronomers started using telescopes, not unlike those that Galileo Galilei used to discover the moons of Jupiter. They also started using secondary instruments like prisms to study the sun during an eclipse. French astronomer Jules Janssen traveled to India to view a solar eclipse on August 18th of 1868. Using a telescope and a prism, he noticed there was a bright yellow spectral line from right around the sun's corona. The discovery was independently duplicated on October 20th of that year by English astronomer Norman Lockyer. Together with English chemist Edward Franklin, they named the element Helios after the Greek word for the sun. Studying a solar eclipse is how we discovered the element helium. A little more than a decade later, during the 1879 eclipse, another pair of astronomers independently discovered what they thought was a new element called coronium. But it turned out this wasn't a new element at all, but rather exceptionally hot iron in the solar corona. It was studying a solar eclipse that astronomers learned that the sun's corona is unbelievably hot, millions of degrees hotter than the sun's surface. But perhaps the most interesting thing we've learned about the universe from a solar eclipse is that Einstein was right with his theory of general relativity. Hundreds of years before Einstein, Isaac Newton published the Principia and laid out his view of the universe. It was a neat and orderly one governed by forces and laws. But Einstein's work on relativity in the early 1900s went against Newton in many ways. Namely, he argued that space is not static. For Newton, space was inert and unchanging. For Einstein, objects can change structures in space. Einstein used the fourth dimension of time to create what he called the fabric of space-time. Whereas Newton held that light traveled from, say, the sun to the earth by photons moving through the vacuum, Einstein said that they traveled on a straight line but could be warped along the fabric of space-time by the gravity of a larger body. It's almost as if space-time is a trampoline surface and a planet is a bowling ball. A photon is a marble rolling along it, and while it might bend its path around the bowling ball, to the photon, it's still traveling in a straight line. For Einstein, gravity was an effect of the warping of the fabric of space-time, whereas for Newton, it was a direct attraction. The problem for Einstein was he needed some way to prove it, and an eclipse was the answer. Sir Frank Watson Dyson, the Astronomer Royal of Britain at the time, came up with a way to test Einstein's theory. He measured the position of stars that would be near the sun's limb during an eclipse, then measured their position again during an eclipse in 1919. He found that the stars' positions had changed. There was a pronounced warping by the sun's mass, destroying once and for all Newton's idea of inert space. And of course, this eclipse will be no different. While most people just go outside to look at something incredible, to see darkness in the middle of the day, scientists will be doing various experiments to try to learn a little bit more about the sun and our universe by studying this solar eclipse. Thank you guys so much for watching, and I hope this got you a little bit more excited about the upcoming eclipse. And speaking of, be sure to subscribe to Time's channel so you don't miss out on our live streaming event on August 21st. And if you are fascinated by space flight's history, specifically the Apollo era, be sure to check out my own channel, Vintage Space, where you will get weekly videos unpacking things you never thought to even ask questions about. 
Thank you so much, Amy, for that clip. And if I may be a bit of a fanboy, I've watched it twice already before we broadcast it today. And I think one of the things it shows is that an eclipse operates two ways on our brain. On the one hand, we see it as something primal and powerful and spiritual. And on the other hand, the world's greatest scientists have also been able to cut that part of their brain down for a moment and focus on the empirical, focus on the hard science. So that, I think, brings us to something about what the eclipse has, the effect the eclipse has on all of us, and I think we'll all be feeling a little bit of that today. And back to you in New York. I think that's absolutely right. And we are, of course, not the only space nerds around today. As we showed you before, in addition to the 12.25 million people living in the path of totality, there are going to be roughly between 1.85 million and 7.4 million Americans traveling to catch even just a glimpse of the Great American Eclipse. That's like having 20 Woodstock music festivals happening simultaneously across the country. And among the millions, there is one man who is like the mayor of totality. He's an astrophysicist, and his fellow eclipse chasers call him Mr. Eclipse. One uh, astronomer described it as a curtain of doom, and suddenly you're immersed in the shadow. When you see a total eclipse, you will realize for the first time what the meaning of awesome is. Bailey's Beats! Totality! Because an eclipse is awesome. Everything else is mundane. My name is Fred Espinak. I'm known as Mr. Eclipse because of all the work I've done on eclipse prediction and eclipse observations and eclipse photography and I've been to all seven continents to see total eclipses of the sun. Probably one of the uh, most memorable eclipses I had was to India in 1995. I was with a tour group of about 30 people, and in, in fact, uh, there was one woman on the, on the trip who had been trying to see an eclipse for 20 years. And I just said, hmm. <laughs> Nice hair. <laughs> you know, I thought, huh, <laughs> like you did. There's an interesting guy. And, you know, then it just, it just went from there. You thought I was funny. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I prefer Ms. Eclipse to Mrs. Eclipse, but we, we argue about that sometimes. Fred and I have been married for about 10 years and we've been together about 20 years, so it took him a while, but we finally made it. After I retired, Pat and I moved out to a, a place called Arizona Sky Village. It's a village designed for people who have a love of the night sky. In order to get away from city lights, which plagued most of the country. We've had to abandon civilization, so to speak, and I've always wanted to live someplace where I could go out and really see the Milky Way any night. Probably the most stunning thing to see here, even without a telescope, is the Milky Way. And you can see all these features looking out into the Milky Way at night, and especially through photography that can reveal things much fainter than we can see with the naked eye. I think it's wonderful to be married to somebody who has a passion. I do. So many people, I feel, I don't know, they watch too much television, or they just spend too much time being a passive observer instead of going out into the world. I think I'm that kind of a person too, but he's made it very easy for me to be that kind of a person. Oh, she, sometimes I take myself too seriously. <laughs> she makes me laugh. <laughs> All my world travels with, with solar eclipses has, has given me a, a greater acceptance to appreciate the diversity of the people of this planet. But we've got to learn to, to live together. Do I think we're alone in the universe? Well, somebody, it might have been Carl Sagan, that said, 
that um, if in this vast universe we're the only ones, um, it's a colossal waste of space. I cannot imagine a cuter couple or a cuter way to find a spouse. All right, let's head back to Casper, Wyoming with our own Jeffrey Kluger, who caught up with Mayor Kenny Humphrey and Anna Wilcox, Casper's Eclipse Festival organizer. They're going to discuss the economic windfall the Eclipse has brought to the town that is known really more for skiing than for its incredible celestial events. Thanks, Amy. We're here at the Casper Convention and Visitors Bureau, and I'm with Mayor Kaneen Humphrey and with Anna Wilcox, the Executive Director of the Wyoming Eclipse Festival. And I want to start with Mayor Humphrey. The sun and the moon have had this event planned for millions of years. Um, Casper hasn't had quite as much time to prepare. Uh, when did you first start thinking uh, about the eclipse and about how to plan for it? Sure. You know, I had the great opportunity to meet with the kind of the Astrocon group back in 2012, 2013. And, and that's the amateur astronomy group. Yes. So they're the ones that let me know what was going on and that they planned on filling our city and doubling our population and thus starts the planning of an adventure. Terrific. And what about some of the metrics we talked about? How many people are coming and how much water and how much food you're providing? We've really looked at it uh, since last June at about 35,000 people that we would accommodate here in Casper. Which is more than half of Casper's population. Yes. Over again, yes. Right? And that's just based on hotel rooms and campgrounds. And of course, we had to take a rough estimate of how many people will have friends and family come visit, how many people will put their home on Airbnb, etc. Right. So that gave us that number. And then, you know, I think like most communities, we still have that full question mark of how many people will actually be here today. But we know that we'll be entertaining up to 35,000 people for four or five days building up to it. That's quite a uh, guest list. Yes. Uh, Mayor Humphrey, what do you see? First of all, what is the economic boon um, to Casper, if there's even a way of estimating that right now? What do you see going forward in terms of what this eclipse could do for Casper as a vacation and tourism destination? You know, last year we threw some numbers around of really just seeing something maybe along the lines of $100,000 um, revenue towards the city of Casper. What we want now is to showcase our community to all of our visitors, all of the people that live here. I think this brings a new life to a city. We're not a ghost town anymore. We're pretty rocking around here. <laughs> Terrific. Well, thank you both thank for you. being here today. And back to you, Amy, as the countdown to totality continues. Don't forget to share your photos with us on Twitter at hashtag Time Solar Eclipse. And be sure to check out our 360 stream of the eclipse in Casper, Wyoming by clicking the link in the description or visiting time.com slash 360 eclipse. And if you're watching us on YouTube right now, you can click the info card right up here. So still to come, we've got the path of totality across the country, so don't go anywhere.
So that's still the live shot from Casper, Wyoming. And still to come, we've got more from Jeffrey and Marsha on the ground in Casper. In, and also some reflections on space from the late Carl Sagan's wife, Andrian. But now I am thrilled to be joined by Time for Kids reporter Caroline Curran, who has made her way from Studio B over here to join us in Mission Control. Caroline, it is awesome to have you here on set with me. Thank you for having me. So Caroline, our, in our previous segment, Jeffrey Kluger interviewed the mayor of Casper, Wyoming, to discuss how the eclipse is causing a bit of an eco like a economic boom in that city. In fact, I actually read that one motel in Casper, Wyoming, is selling rooms for more than $1,400 a night. Do you think your parents would be okay to spend that much money to give you a path, a view of that totality? <laughs> there definitely is a big economic bloom as a result. It's very clear. So. I think that's really interesting that there is that as a result of this. And Caroline, I hear that you've, um, you've done some research on another way the eclipse is generating profits for savvy entrepreneurs, and that is eclipse memorabilia. I hear you've actually looked up some interesting things that are available online. Can you tell us what kind of memorabilia or kind of things you've been finding that people can buy to commemorate the eclipse? There are so many products out there that are being sold that are related to the solar eclipse, one of which was recently released by the United States Postal Service, and they're actually these stamps that are an image of the solar eclipse, and with the heat of your finger, if you rub the stamp, it will change to an image of the moon. So that's a really great product that you can use to remember the solar eclipse in the form of a stamp, which is really unique. There are also products like um, a lot of books out there related to the solar eclipse. There are ones targeted for both children and adults. So ones that are targeted towards children include, you know, puzzles, games, and there are a lot of books out there that are targeted towards children to use while they're on a road trip to the solar eclipse. And books out there also for adults include maps of the solar eclipse path, what the moon and sun look like from different perspectives, and that's a really great way to also remember the solar eclipse. Lastly, of course, when you're viewing the solar eclipse, you're going to be using your glasses or your viewing material, whatever that may be. And so if you keep your glasses, um, you know, they're selling for this huge range um, from $25 to $900. So there's a big boom from that. So if you keep your glasses, you can use it to view another solar eclipse later or even then just remember the event because it is quite an amazing one. That's awesome. And yeah, there's definitely some really neat stuff out there that everyone can, can collect and kind of build their own little, I remember the 2017 eclipse package. Exactly. And speaking of, I think we are going to go live to Oregon where we are almost at totality. So this is just, this is a stunning shot. This beautiful, tiny crescent of the sun, which is something that we never get to see. Well. So we are, oh, we're only about six minutes away from totality in Salem. So we are going to just, I think we might just stay on this shot. This is absolutely beautiful. And I think I'm seeing, if we're looking at this, we are looking at this through a solar filter because we are not seeing anything but the light of the sun. It looks almost like you can see a couple of sunspots towards the middle of the crescent. I think that might be what we're looking at, unless it's an artifact in our monitor. Um, but this is just an unbelievable sight. I mean, we're sort of used to seeing a crescent moon, but it's wild to be able to see a crescent sun. This is not something that we really get a chance to see very often. Usually it's pictures, occasion, you know, artwork, but that's not, <laughs> that's not the same type of reality. So so this is a really, really beautiful, rare sight that we're seeing in our own backyards for a lot of people. So here's a little more just about Salem, Oregon. It's, it's not a massive town. Again, all, so many of the cities that are being hit with totality are getting this massive economic boom because they're smaller towns. The population of Salem is just 167,000, and it's mainly a town known for farming and, and some government um, elements to it. The eclipse forecast, luckily, as we saw, because we had a beautiful sight of that uh, of that sliver of the sun, uh, we've got sunny skies in Salem for everybody who's out there viewing the eclipse. And uh, it is nicknamed, apparently, the Cherry City. This is actually not something that I've ever heard of, but I assume that means that there are beautiful cherry trees and cherry crops out there. So let's get another look at this beautiful crescent sun in Salem. We are less than four minutes away from complete totality. This is really, this is absolutely stunning. So Caroline, what do you think of this? Have you seen a total eclipse? Have you seen any of these feeds? Are you excited to be watching this? What does this make you feel? 
I've never seen a solar eclipse in person before, so it's really just amazing to see that because it is such a rare event being, you know, the great American solar eclipse. It's really just a spectacular image and it's so interesting to watch. It really is just something completely different. And oh, this is another, apparently we're getting another feed. This is, this is the same place. This is still Salem, but it's, um, it's a different shot. It's looking, this for some reason, maybe it's the movement of the camera. This makes me feel more like I'm there seeing it. I don't know, does it make you feel a little bit more like you're there as opposed <laughs> totally. to the static shot that almost looks fake? <laughs> it's not fake, obviously. Uh, let's not get into any of <laughs> the conspiracies. <laughs> it is a sliver, all right. We are less than three minutes away. This is absolutely beautiful. And you're starting to see the color of the sun coming out. Oh, this is a NASA, oh, we've got a NASA feed. There's the NASA meatball up in the corner. I should have seen that. So this is a NASA feed. This is really beautiful. This is really incredible. Do you, Caroline, do you know anyone who's on the ground in Salem or anywhere in the path of totality today? Do you have any friends that went out or anyone? Well, my, actually, I know my science teacher, for a fact, is out looking at the solar eclipse. And I think it's really cool because we learned about the solar eclipse in school this year. So it's really spectacular to see that image and see the sun as a crescent. It's just a really really cool image. That is awesome. That's awesome. All right. Well, we've only got two minutes to totality here in Salem. Um, so I think we're just going to um, let you guys watching the stream, um, let you guys enjoy watching this last sliver disappear and see that totality come up. This is going to be exciting and beautiful. Thanks to the eclipse, a crazy thing is happening in a small town of Hopkinsville, Kentucky. So it's been renamed Eclipseville for today. Hopkinsville will find itself in the path of totality later this afternoon. 62 years to the day, um, residents claimed to have had a close encounter with some little green men. So let's take a look at the story and the speculation that's drawing thousands to the bluegrass state. The eclipse falling on the anniversary date of August the 21st of the actual event that occurred here in Kelly. On the 21st of August in 1955, supposedly a spaceship complete with the circular blinking lights landed 10 miles north of Hopkinsville. What if during the eclipse some aliens returned? And I guess the only way we can look at that is we must be here to find out. The story behind the Kelly encounter of August the 21st, 1955 is so amazing. Um, the farm belonged to my grandmother. She was a widow at the time. She had three small children. And it just so happened the weekend that this occurred, uh, my dad and his wife Vera and their friends, Billy Ray and June Taylor, came in for the weekend. Lo and behold, coming from the back near the woods was this little three, three and a half foot tall being. Little figures about three feet tall. Huge glowing eyes, huge head. Extensively long arms. And it was floating. Billy Ray runs out the front door and as he's standing there ready to shoot at something, they see a clawed hand, shot it, hit it, floated away. After a standoff of about two to three hours, 
the little characters disappeared into the horse weeds and climbed a ladder into the spacecraft and took off, supposedly. There were um, airplanes and helicopters and things like that, military going over the farm the very next day. All that they discovered was when a young rookie state trooper was walking through some horse weed and all of a sudden he heard a ow about like that. Looked down and realized he had stepped upon the tail of a tomcat. You know, I've been asked many times if I believe if aliens really existed. I don't believe that in our humanistic mind that we could comprehend all that God may have created. But for this historian, the responsibility is to review the evidence and come to a logical conclusion. And comments were made that they were probably dipping stoutly into the panther juice. Yes, I believe something happened that night and something happened to that family that night. They saw something. I think of the fact that the solar eclipse event occurs on the same calendar day, August 21st, is happenstance. Some people would say that there's an alignment of features that would bring this to be, and maybe so, again, whom am I to say? All right, we're going to give a little bit more about the aliens in Hopkinsville in a little bit, but I think we might be going back to see what's going on with the eclipse in Oregon. I think we've just gotten totality, so let's, are we in Oregon? Let's see. This is Wyoming, okay, we're back in Casper, Wyoming. So we're getting close to totality, I think, uh, judging by where we were in Oregon. Okay, we've got Oregon coming back up. There we are with totality in Oregon. That is a beautiful shot. We're just gonna look at this. Look at the corona. Oh, we're just gonna look at that for a minute. And that is the sun coming back that blaringly quick, the diamond ring effect that we saw there earlier with the one spot of the sun kind of taking over and you can see immediately um, with no filter that it just washes it out. The sunlight comes back really strong, really, really fast, but it is absolutely beautiful. It looks like they're zooming in a little bit. We're just gonna let that replay for a second here and just watch it, it's gorgeous. So it looks like NASA's feed is hopping around from different cameras in Oregon because it's, of course, slightly different timing at different parts of the state. So we're getting, we have the sun emerge on one spot, and now it looks like we're going to get it again from another location. This is going to be gorgeous.
All right, so this solar eclipse that we're watching, this is beautiful, but as we saw earlier, humans kind of understand what's going on, but plants and animals are, you know, don't have the same understanding of the world. So Caroline, what do you, what do you think would happen with plants and animals in the path of totality as it suddenly goes from full daylight to slightly darker to then dark, like we just saw happen in Salem? Like you said, these animals and plants clearly can't anticipate a solar eclipse like we do. And so a lot of animals will actually, you know, be convinced it's nighttime and a lot of them will prepare to go to bed and some flowers will even close because they all think it's night. I think that's, yeah, that's spot on. Um, so let's take a quick look at something we've, um, we've prepared to look at what really happens to plants and animals during a total solar eclipse. Animals always freak out the same way the people do. People scream and shout and applaud when the total eclipse happens and the animals do strange things. At one eclipse we were in Bolivia and we're all looking at the total eclipse when somebody shouts, look down, look down, and we do and we're surrounded by llamas. I don't know where they came from. When the eclipse was over they all lined up in a line and they marched away. At another total eclipse in the Galapagos, we were on a small boat, and five minutes before totality, every whale and dolphin in the vicinity, dozens, surfaced and swam back and forth and watched the eclipse with us. Five minutes after totality, they all swam away, and we never saw them again. All right, we are back with our live view of the moon covering the sun in Casper, Wyoming, where we've kind of got our, our ground zero, our mission control, or rather, uh, for the eclipse. So we're at 13 minutes, just past 13 minutes to totality. So uh, what we're seeing here, again, what just like what we saw in Oregon, we've got this beautiful crescent sun, which is something we never see, and it's really getting, getting slim in there. I mean, it's been an hour since it was just, you know, eating a tiny bite out of it, making it look like a rounded Pac-Man. <laughs> and now it's this tiny little sliver and we're really going to see it disappear in a second here. And it's just absolutely stunning. But I think we're going to, we're going to stay on this. We're going to stay on watching the moon slowly cover the sun and just watch this kind of, I mean, slow burn, even though it's covering up the burn of the sun as we get to totality and really kind of capture the excitement there. So let's just, uh, let's just take a look.
right, so we're jumping. We still have our sun in the corner, but we're jumping to a crowd shot. Uh, this is on the ground in Casper, Wyoming, which is about 10 minutes from totality, and you can see that it's getting darker. It doesn't look like it's the middle of the day. It looks like it's early, early evening. It's definitely getting out there, and you can see everybody looking safely with their eclipse glasses. Um, you, they'd be able to see just what we have in that corner, see that beautiful crescent of the sun and those sunspots. So we're, we're a little, little under 10 minutes to seeing the sun completely disappear. All right, we are just over eight and a half minutes away from seeing totality in Casper, Wyoming. So let's rejoin Jeff and Marsha who are on the ground and can bring us what it's like at the scene of where totality is about to happen. Jeff, do we have you? Yes, you do. We are here. It is a certain wonderful kind of eerie here. There's a wind that's whipped up that hadn't been here before as a result of the cooling temperatures in the air. The darkness right now is about where we, you would be at about 5.30, 6 in the evening if all these people that were out here just for barbecuing. It's got that sort of winding down of the day feel, even though it's still 11.44 in the morning. We're not hearing any night birds or crickets yet, but we could be hearing that in a little while. And what we're seeing now is simply the disappearance, the dying of the light in the middle of the day. It's, it's quite primal, it's quite powerful. Marsha, you're a woman of science, you're a woman of technology. Are you feeling any emotion, any surge coming up? I, I feel that, that um, sort of visceral emotion of how cool is this yeah. kind of thing. And the light is really interesting you know, since everybody's in the digital world now, it's like you slid the bar in your Photoshop down towards the yellow a little bit. It doesn't quite look like twilight. There's more of a yellow quality to it um, and and such a noticeable drop in temperature. I mean, it's, it's impressive. Yeah, and there is also a very noticeable drop in the volume of conversation. There was, there were a lot of people cheering and talking and conversing loudly, and now there's almost a slowly church-like reverence to the atmosphere here. People are waiting for something magnificent and something celestially picturesque to happen. And it's nice to be a part of it. So back to you, Amy, in New York. All right, we've still got the scene in Casper and we can see in the, from the last crowd shot to this one, it's much darker. And we've still got the crescent sun in the corner. We are just six minutes and 15 seconds away from totality. So we're just gonna watch. We're just gonna watch the sun disappear and hopefully see some reactions from excited viewers on the ground.
All right, well, as you can see, we are just a minute and less than a minute and a half away from totality. We've just got a few seconds of the last sliver of the sun before we're gonna see something truly spectacular out of Casper, Wyoming. All right, this is so wild. So we're in totality and of course we're seeing the solar corona and what's super neat um, is down towards the bottom on the top and sort of in the upper right hand corner, you can kind of see these these lines that look like it's kind of, it's like a, like a, almost a physical manifestation of the solar wind, although I don't entirely think that's what it is. But there's one over this kind of pinkish spot in the upper right hand corner that looks like it's arced. It's really interesting to kind of see any detail in the solar corona without being, you know, a shot taken from a NASA satellite. It's, this is stunning. All right, well, we just saw the sun completely disappear, disappear behind the moon and we're slowly seeing it come back. That was a quick totality, but we're getting now the reverse of that. The sun's moving across and we have the first sliver of the sun reappearing in Casper, Wyoming.
So as the sun starts to reappear from behind the moon, we are also starting to be able to see the crowd again that's gathered in the field out in Casper, Wyoming. They were plunged into total darkness and now it's like, like sunrise, but not. It's, it's interesting out there. All right, we are going to go back down live in the field in Casper, Wyoming to hear from Jeffrey and Marsha just what it was like to experience that totality we all just saw. I will have to say, having seen only one eclipse before, this one left me as drained as the other one did. It is a deeply emotional experience when totality hit. There was applause, there was cheering, there were gasps, and then there was sort of a universally agreed upon silence while people would simply watch what was happening. That was what struck me the most, the, the sort of communal quality of strangers gathering by the tens of thousands to watch this event and experience it together. And I must say, maybe I'm overly sentimental, at the end of it, I just had the impulse to hug the people in our crew because we had been here for it, we had done it, and we had seen this thing together. Marsha, what was your reaction? Uh, people are still hugging, so yes. you know it's <laughs> it's not an instantaneous reaction. It's yeah. one that extends. You know, I'd watched um, videos of people watching eclipses, and I'd I heard them clap and cheer, and I thought, why are you clapping? And yet, it's almost an uh, an urge you can't resist to clap and cheer. Yay, moon, good job. Yeah, uh, exactly. But it's yeah. such an unusual event. You know, you can see how ancient civilizations could have thought that this was truly the end of days. Right, of course. The dragon was yeah, really, really eating the sun. And of course, as I think we said earlier, one of the things that makes the eclipse work at all and makes the fit so perfect is that the moon is 400 times larger than the sun, or the sun is 400 times larger than the moon, but the sun is also 400 times farther away. And as a result, the disks fit perfectly, which makes the eclipse possible. And that's one other thing that makes you appreciate the improbability of the eclipse, that if it weren't for that wonderful bit of cosmic serendipity, we wouldn't be here today. We wouldn't be feeling the way we're feeling right now. And tens of millions of people would not have gathered on the path of totality. And all of the people who still have this to come east of us wouldn't have this wonderful thing in their future. So we're all sort of recovering here. We're all sort of catching our <laughs> breath. And while we do that, we'll throw back to you in New York, Amy.
Well, thank you so much, Jeff and Marsha, for sharing that with us. Uh, you guys are so lucky to have been there to see that. I really now wish I had been in the field to see that once in a lifetime event and, and with my own eyes. Caroline, what were your takeaways from seeing that? I mean, we're all nose to the monitors and here to look. What did, how did it feel like? It's really interesting to watch and it would be amazing to go one day to see the moon move across the sun, see the different shapes, the outline of the sun. It's really spectacular, spectacular to look at and watch. Did it make you more curious about the sun, sort of being able to see a bit of the corona and what we think might have been flares or those pink spots that it were It definitely not sure? made me more curious. I'm wondering what that was. I don't know if you saw around the edge, we were speculating that there might have been flares around the sun. It was really a beautiful image and it was so, so wonderful to watch. Yeah, I think it's almost impossible to look at something like that without a sense of childlike wonder. I mean, it makes everyone kind of in awe of where we live in in space. So speaking of, let's go back to Time Studio B with NASA Solar System Ambassador Charles Fuco, who is ready to unpack Eclipse magic with a group of third and fourth graders. Hey kids, I'm Charles and I'm with NASA and the AAS 2017 Total Solar Eclipse crew. What are your names? My name's Holly Ann. My name's Grace. My name's Solomon. So tell me something, what do you know about uh, eclipses? An eclipse is when the sun, the moon, and the earth line up. Very good. And then what happens? What can happen when they all line up like that, Holly Ann? Um, the moon can cover the sun and then it gets like dark earlier than usual. Very good. How big is the sun? Well, Holly Ann, that's a great question. The sun is really large. It's the largest object in our solar system. But to be specific, it's about 864,000 miles in diameter. So from one end of its equator to the other. So what size is the moon? And the moon, that's another good question. The moon's a lot smaller. It's about 2,000 miles across. But if they're different sizes, how do they line up? That's an excellent question. The sun is 400 times larger than the moon, but the moon's 400 times closer to us than the sun is. So because the moon is 400 times closer to us, it appears that much larger. So in reality, in the sky, they appear to be just about the same size. So let's, let's do that using our thumbs. We're gonna pretend that our eye is the earth, we're gonna pretend our thumb is the moon, and we're gonna pretend that that light is the sun. So pick your favorite thumb. All right, pick your favorite eye, keep it open. Close your other one. Now, which is bigger, the light or your thumb? The light. By a lot, right? I would say so. Okay, so now let's put the thumb up, keep that eye closed, and bring your thumb in until your thumb grows larger and larger and larger, until it just covers the light. And that is making your total eclipse. So that's how a total eclipse could happen when you have two objects that are nowhere near the same size. That was a lot larger than this, right? But yet you can make this appear to be the same size as that. That's how, that's how totality works. Look what you have in front of you. Handy dandy eclipse glasses. And these are very easy to use. And can we show everybody how to, how to make them into glasses? So this. Okay, what are you doing? You're folding them on the, on the yes. hinge? Yeah. Yes. Good. This you put them on just like you'd put on a regular pair of glasses. So let's, let's demonstrate that. And Holly, you're probably gonna have to hold on to yours. So what do you think, are they fashionable? Not even close. <laughs> okay, now do you see anything through them right now? No. Okay, that's a good sign because that means they're working. The only thing you should be able to see through them is the sun on a sunny day. When you're looking at the eclipse with these, you wanna make sure you always have these on. The only time you take them off would be during totality when the moon is completely covering the sun. Who knows what this is? A colander. A colander, very good. So what you do is you take, in fact, why don't, Grace, you wanna try this and demonstrate it? Okay. Let's pretend I'll be over here with the sun. Okay, pretending this is the sun. Aim it right at the sun and keep it close to the ground like you're doing. And what do you think is gonna appear on the ground? Like crescents probably? Yes! You're gonna see little solar eclipse crescents on the ground. So one more way that's free and safe and not looking at the sun is using your hands. Uh, Holly Ann, you wanna show me how you think you could use your fingers to look at an eclipse? Yes. What do you, show me, what do you think? Oh, okay, so you got three fingers up on one hand. Whoa, hold on. Three fingers up on one hand, three on the other. And then what do you do? 
You cross mm. them. Cross them. And you put your hand over the ground, and what do you know? You've got a free Eclipse viewer using your very own fingers. That's really cool. Did everybody have a great time today? Yes. yes. Good. Well, I want you all to go outside and enjoy the Eclipse. Can you do that? Yes. yes. Awesome. Thanks, everybody. As you can see, we still have this beautiful shot of the now growing uh, uh, sun, the arc of the sun. And we are going to go back live on the ground to Casper, Wyoming with Jeff. And I think he's got a special guest to, to speak to us with. So, Jeff? Uh, that is right, Amy, a very special guest. I'm here with uh, Air Force, retired Air Force General Kevin Chilton, who also happens to be a three-time veteran of the shuttle. So I am very humbled today because between Marsha and Kevin, these two people have now been in space collectively eight times more than I ever have. <laughs> so uh, General Chilton uh, has been up three times, commanded one flight to uh, the Mir space station, mm -hmm. um, many years ago and we were speaking earlier about the idea that in your job as a military man as a pilot as a commander you have to have a very sort of geometric turn of mind a very literal scientific turn of mind how did that serve today or did the emotional part of you simply take over and shut oh, that down uh, jeff i'd say it all went out the window yeah. that totality yeah. uh, i mean we understand this now it's totally predictable the science is well understood but uh, it's, it's hard to put words to describe what it's like at the instant of totality. I mean, the temperature drops. Um, what stunned me was everybody cheered, and then everybody got very quiet, and you couldn't hear anything. All the city lights below us came on. And, and besides looking at the corona, which is something I really wanted to see, I took the time to just do a 360 scan around, and it was sunset everywhere you looked, in you know, every quadrant around you, sunset or sunrise. Right. You know, that the sky was that color. And then my wife, who's with me, and my youngest daughter, that was special to be with them. One of them yeah. said, look, there's a star and probably a planet. Yeah. But to see that in daytime, um, you, you throw the math and the science out the window and you just take it all in. It was fantastic. It's extraordinary. How do you think this affects people if I am, you have a young daughter here. I have two young daughters. There are children all over America watching today. Do you think this provides a bit of a kickstart, a bit of a sort of a turbo charge to, to their interest in science? Oh, I think so, absolutely. I mean, I mean, the reason I came was because when I was a young boy uh, living in Los Angeles, I saw a partial solar eclipse. My uncle got some uh, smoked lenses from the welding shop, yeah. and we watched it, and it, it just fascinated me. But I'd never had a chance to do it since. Right. And when I you know, realized I was in driving striking range to do this from Colorado Springs, I'm not going to miss this. Uh, but to your point, you know, my wife, Kathy, who she told me, she said she really, really wasn't interested in making this long drive up here and, you know, on the long traffic we anticipate going home until it happened. Yeah. And then she just said, I am so glad I came. So it does move people. And I think right. it moves young people as well. It did me in my youth to be more curious and to try to better understand uh, things about the solar systems, about astro, astrophysics. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I'm, I'm sure this will inspire more than one or two young people here today to study science and engineering. And one last question. I know that you saw your first total solar eclipse today, but you're a bit of a fancier of lunar eclipses too. <laughs> and you told me earlier about a particular lunar eclipse that uh, you watched and may have been breaking a few rules when you did it. Well, we weren't breaking any rules, <laughs> but it was unique. Yeah. Know, um, a friend of mine, uh, Rob Rivers, uh, was one of our instructor pilots at NASA. He called me up one afternoon, and I really hadn't been paying attention to the lunar eclipse schedule. He said, hey, do you want to go up and watch the lunar eclipse with me tonight? And I said, sure. And so uh, we checked out a NASA T-38, which we were allowed to do for flying time. We took off, though, and timed it such that we took off at night, flew out over the Gulf of Mexico in total darkness, and then watched the lunar eclipse. And uh, that was really neat because we had no background city light at all. The colors were phenomenal. And it was just the two of us up there at 35,000 feet alone in the silence, uh, taking that all in. So uh, I feel blessed. I've had two great opportunities to be with family and friends 
to see both the lunar eclipse and now this great solar eclipse today was just, I mean, words can't describe it. It's extraordinary. Well, thank you for being here. You it's bet. nice to have someone with your authority and your gravitas sort of share and frame the well, experience for us. My pleasure. Thanks so much. Back to you, Amy. Awesome. Thanks, Jeff. And now, not only am I jealous that you got to see totality, I am jealous that you got to do it and hang out with two astronauts. But moving on, eclipses are certainly not a new phenomena in the natural world. They are as old as time, even if we didn't always understand exactly what was happening. Let's take another look at eclipses and their impact throughout history. To witness a total solar eclipse is to experience fear at least a little. Most people wouldn't admit that. We're 21st century humans after all, and we know that an eclipse is a completely harmless thing. That doesn't mean, however, that the tens of millions of people who witnessed the great American eclipse on August 21st won't be a little spooked all the same. All of us operate on neurological software that was written when we were proto-humans living on the savannas. And to the more primitive part of our brains, there's something deeply unsettling about the sight of an eclipse. The sky darkens, which it does every day, but to a shade of blue and then black and blue that occurs at no other time. Throughout history, human affairs have been shaped by the suddenness and eeriness of a solar eclipse. The Lydians and the Medes ended their war in 585 BC when a total eclipse darkened the sky and convinced the combatants that it was a sign of disapproval over the ongoing fighting. The English saw an unhappy cause and effect between the eclipse of August 2, 1133 and the death of King Henry I, even though Henry died more than two years later. In the Odyssey, Homer recounted the eclipse of 1177 BC, writing, and the sun has perished out of heaven and an evil mist hovers over all. Over time, of course, humans became less superstitious and more scientific, and an eclipse became not an occasion for fear, but an opportunity to learn. During the total eclipse of August 18, 1868, French astronomer Jules Janssen studied the prominences, the flames and flares that dance around the edges of the sun's blacked out disk. Looking through a spectroscopic prism, he saw the signature of helium, thus discovering the second lightest element in the universe, even before it had been found on Earth. Much more significantly, on May 29, 1919, British astronomer Arthur Eddington used a total eclipse to prove one of the premises of Einstein's general theory of relativity, that gravity will bend light by a predictable amount. Months before the event, Eddington measured the precise position of the Hyades star cluster. Then, on May 29, when the sun was blacked out and the stars popped into view, he measured it again, and it was different by a factor perfectly consistent with the bending Einstein had predicted in his 1915 theory. The Times of London announced the discovery with the headline, Revolution in Science, New Theory of the Universe, Newtonian Ideas Overthrown. That, in some ways, illustrates one more gift of the solar eclipse, that it allows for two different kinds of vision the aesthetic and the insightful, the glimpse of beauty and the glimpse of the working of the cosmos itself. All right, we are back with our shot of Casper, Wyoming. As we can see, this, the moon has moved quite a bit, quite quickly, since we had that amazing moment of totality. And we're starting to get its closing about half uh, sorry, rather a quarter of the sun, um, and it's going to get bigger and back to what we know as our normal. No matter how many times we look at the lunar shadows stretching across the country or the blotting out of the sun, it's never not spectacular. Someone who constantly seeks answers about the grandeur of space is Anne Druyan. She co-wrote and co-produced the miniseries Cosmos, A Personal Journey with astronomer Carl Sagan in 1979. She also worked on the sequel Cosmos, A Spacetime Odyssey with astrophysicist Neil deGrasse Tyson in 2014. She sat down with time to talk about the mythic power inherent in every solar eclipse.
that sudden chill, the motion of the birds, the way that the rest of life reacts to the blocking out of the sun is almost, you know, it has that kind of mythic, biblical power to it, and it should have it. generations, we applied the kind of false pattern recognition. So, you know, there's a darkness at noon. Oh my God, that means that the king is not in favor, or gods are angry, or we have committed some terrible sin by sleeping with the wrong person, or eating the wrong food on the wrong day, things like that. But it's also the beginning of science, and the beginning of figuring out the universe. What I love so much about science is, for me, it is informed worship. It's a high degree of humility to say, we know nothing, we're very young, we're very new at this. Give us a machine that can ferret out those misconceptions and enable us to see nature as she really is and to love her as she is. That, to me, is defining in love. I mean, really, when you love someone, is it good if you just love the illusions you have about them? Or is it really a deeper love to want to know them as they truly are, to love them so much that you will not turn away and flinch at reality? That soaring spiritual joy, that goosebump raising feeling of being part of nature and understanding it even a little is one of the greatest human experiences. We are back on this beautiful shot of the growing sun in Casper, Wyoming, and we're gonna go back to the ground now where I hear Jeff has found a mother and daughter who've come out to witness the eclipse in person today. So let's go to Jeff. Uh, uh, that's right. I am here with Archie Ray, Marcy Ray, and Reagan May. I got all that right. Yes, <laughs> from Buda, Texas, and Marcy is ten. I mean, uh, Reagan is ten years old, and this is, I assume, your first eclipse. And yes. <laughs> so, what made you make this pilgrimage from as far away as Buda, Texas? We needed to take a vacation and decided that this would be the best place to do it. And Got to come up here and see it. Something I've always wanted to see. I've always loved astronomy, and uh, finally got to got to do it, and it was well worth it. When did you set out? Uh, we came uh, actually to Denver last week, last Wednesday. So mm -hmm. we did all of Colorado, and now we're here in Wyoming. And are you staying in Casper, or you? Oh no, one of we the couldn't find a place in, in Casper. Yeah, yeah so we're actually in staying in Fort Collins, Colorado. Fort Collins, yeah. And what about you, Reagan? Are many of your friends watching the eclipse? Are many of them around? Uh, I have no clue right now. <laughs> <laughs> you have no clue. All right, so I asked you beforehand, um, so you have now officially decided to become an astronaut. That's what we all hope when kids see eclipses. But did this touch you in some way and make you interested in science? In some way, yes. Yeah? What did you feel? Did you feel any wonder, fear, creepiness when the sun went away in the middle of the day? I feel amazement. Amazement. Isn't that extraordinary? Yeah, because you know the ancients would look at it and think a dragon had eaten the sun or something was terribly wrong. But I think you feel like we are all past that now. Yes. Will you be coming back for future eclipses? You know, there's another one in 2024 in the U.S. and it will be available not in quite the same spot. Do you think you'll become eclipse pilgrims, eclipse chasers? Absolutely. Yeah, it's a fun thing to do. Yes, it was super cool. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, good luck fighting the traffic, getting out of here today. It is not going to be easy, but it's worth it to have been here. Yes, it was. Thank you. I think so. Thank you so much for Thank being you. here. Thanks. And back to you, Amy, in New York.
Thanks, Jeff, for that. It's amazing to hear what people on the ground in Casper are saying about the experience, particularly kids and people who've never seen an eclipse before. This is, of course, our shot of the sun in Casper. We are back with this shot. Uh, we've got about half the sun maybe uncovered as the moon uh, slowly makes its way across the sun's disk and, and reveals it back to its what we know as our normal daytime state. And I think we are seeing a... Of course, as the sun continues, or as the moon continues to move across the sun, the eclipse is moving across the country. And one of the towns that is going to be seeing totality still later today is Hopkinsville. And as we saw earlier, this is a town that was visited by some interesting little green men uh, just over 50 years ago to the day. So let's revisit that and see just what's going on in Hopkinsville. The eclipse falling on the anniversary date of August the 21st of the actual event that occurred here in Kelly. On the 21st of August in 1955, supposedly a spaceship complete with the circular blinking lights landed 10 miles north of Hopkinsville. What if during the eclipse some aliens return? And I guess the only way we can look at that is we must be here to find out. The story behind the Kelly encounter of August the 21st, 1955 is so amazing. Um, the farm belonged to my grandmother. She was a widow at the time. She had three small children. And it just so happened the weekend that this occurred, uh, my dad and his wife Vera and their friends, Billy Ray and June Taylor, came in for the weekend. Lo and behold, coming from the back, Near the woods was this little three, three and a half foot tall beam. Little figures about three feet tall. Huge glowing eyes, huge head. Extensively long arms. And it was floating. Billy Ray runs out the front door and as he's standing there ready to shoot at something, they see a clawed hand, shot it, hit it, floated away. After a standoff of about two to three hours, the little characters disappeared into the horse weeds and climbed a ladder into the spacecraft and took off, supposedly. There were um, airplanes and helicopters and things like that, military going over the farm the very next day. All that they discovered was when a young rookie state trooper was walking through some horse weed and all of a sudden he heard a ow about like that. Looked down and realized he had stepped upon the tail of a tomcat. You know, I've been asked many times if I believe if aliens really existed. I don't believe that in our humanistic mind that we can comprehend all that God may have created. But for this historian, the responsibility is to review the evidence and come to a logical conclusion and comments were made that they were probably dipping stoutly into the panther juice. Yes, I believe something happened that night and something happened to that family that night. They saw something. I think of the fact that the solar eclipse event occurs on the same calendar day, August 21st, is happenstance. Some people would say that there's an alignment of features that would bring this to be, and maybe so, again, who am I to say? Locals in Hopkinsville, Kentucky, believe that their town was visited by aliens on this date in 1955. Hopkinsville residents remember this close encounter every year with a festival called Little Green Men Days. Our Time for Kids reporter Caroline Curran joins me once again in the studio. Caroline, I understand that you've done a little research on life on other planets. What did you find? 
Well, the universe is obviously such an enormous place, so it's difficult to believe that we're just alone here on planet Earth. But there have been many events reported like in Hopkinsville, so, and some of them have been debunked. and. It's very controversial, so it's difficult to really come to a consensus. It's almost impossible. No one really knows. Are there any previous sort of alien sightings, be it something like in Hopkinsville or something, seeing sort of a UFO, that has struck you personally, that you think is really neat, that you want to uncover, really understand what's going on with that sighting? Well, a lot of people have posted on the internet video and picture evidence of things that they believe to have been UFOs or alien sightings. But a lot of people have tried to debunk these and said that it wasn't a UFO, it wasn't aliens, it was something else. And so it's really difficult to know because the people who were there claimed that it was aliens, but other people are very, very skeptical about it. Right, of course. So well, let's move away from maybe the skeptical UFO side of things and talk about the potential of really finding life on other planets. What have you, have you gone into sort of, or studied anything about what might, where might life might be on other system or other, wow, <laughs> planets or moons in our solar system or maybe even other solar systems? Well, like I said, the universe is obviously a very enormous place, so it's difficult to think, are we alone? And a lot of people don't think we would be alone, and the likelihood of just it being only us. So a lot of people speculate that in another solar system, there might be a planet that can be habitable. Right. Do you hope to find aliens someday? Well, I think it would be very interesting and to know that and to be able to possibly, you know, discover that, communicate with people, and it would be so awesome to figure that out one day. It would be totally awesome. <laughs> I also kind of hope we find some kind of life. All right, uh, speaking of life, <laughs> we are going to go back to Casper, Wyoming and rejoin Jeff and our time photographer who's going to, I think, tell us a little bit more about how he was able to capture that beautiful video stream of totality for us. Uh, Jeff, are you there? Yes, we are here, and I'm here again with Antoine Rubeau, uh, which I am sure I still mispronounce. Um, and I will say that of all of the voices I heard during totality, the one that struck me most was Antoine whooping at some of the images he got. And I actually was willing to draw my eyes away from the sky for a moment to look at what he had on screen. So tell me a little bit about what you captured and how you captured it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, Jeff. It was uh, really breathtaking. So I was really focused on uh, changing the exposure because, you know, the sun is very bright and then suddenly it becomes really, really dark. So we want to see the corona around the sun. So we had a few seconds to do that. And then when it was on, then appears out of nowhere kind of a fire balls on sides and the top of the sun. Right. And I was not expecting that because we cannot see it otherwise. Sure. And I noticed that both before and after you had some sunspot images. You had a fair bit of sun solar activity. Tell me about that a little. Bit. Yeah, those sunspots are really fascinating. It's a different of temperature of with the surface of the sun and some of them are the size of the earth. Right. So, and when I looked at the eclipse itself because, you know, when we locked the exposure I could enjoy it a little bit. Yeah. I became very emotional, yeah. you know. Uh, it was very, very special and remind me a little bit of when I was reading cartoons I was reading when I was a kid uh, called Tintin on the Moon. And, yeah, I really felt like I was there with, with him, yeah. Yeah, Tintin in Wyoming. Now, when I take a picture on my iPhone, the most I can do afterwards is go into the little edit function and make it a little bit greener or a little bluer or a little more cropped. Obviously, the work you're, you have ahead of you now with these images is much more elaborate. So what kind of processing will you do of the eclipse images you have today to get the very most out of them, both scientifically and aesthetically? Well, the thing is, I have mostly a movie, actually, a high-definition movie recorded because we are broadcasting live on fortime.com. So um, I need to look through the sequence again and... Uh, boost the signal, look at how I can extract more information uh, out of those um, you know, fireballs and, and other corona to maximize basically what we see uh, around the sun itself. I'm not sure. I'm, I'm going to work on it and, and see, but I'm so happy, very happy very today. Happy. And the final question, as I said earlier, Antoine is both a gastronomer and an astronomer, and he has been the resident French chef for the time team. So now that the eclipse is over, my question is, what's for lunch? 
Oh, what's for lunch? Uh, still working on it, but I believe we're gonna have some really uh, home, really good uh, grilled cheese sandwich. That's a plan. A French grilled cheese sandwich. Put that down and get to work. I'm going right away. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, back to you, Amy. And here is a look at what we saw earlier of Antoine's work. This is his stunning shot during totality. Uh, you can see the solar corona is this kind of fuzzy layer around the disk of the moon that is completely blocking out the sun. And we can see sort of uh, a pink spot right on the right-hand side and sort of on the lower right-hand corner that um, looking back at it again still strike me they might be uh, uh, some kind of flare. It's really amazing that this is... This was just captured from our site on the ground in Casper. It's so amazingly beautiful. So, Caroline, what are your thoughts about everything we've seen with the eclipse so far this afternoon? The solar eclipse, as we've said, is obviously such an amazing event. And so to see families out there with their kids is really a great thing because I think it's important to get kids interested in STEM and to be able to see that, which is really a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. It's so great to see these families out there and enjoying the event and reporting on it definitely inspiring. Um, speaking of which, I am super excited to invite five-time shuttle astronaut back into our conversation. Marsha, uh, meet Caroline digitally. <laughs> nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. So Caroline, do you have any questions for Marsha about either the eclipse or anything you just said that you were excited to see kids excited about STEM content? What would you like to ask an astronaut? So as a former astronaut, what piece of advice do you have for kids and teens who are interested in pursuing a career in STEM and are inspired by the solar eclipse? That's a great question. What I tell uh, students and young people is do something in a field that you really like, um, a science or technology field, and just pick something that you love or you think you will love and excel in it, do well in it, and from there you can go anywhere. What inspired you to pursue a career in STEM? When I was 10 years old, in the United States, Alan Shepard made the first suborbital flight um, in the Mercury program. And remember, this is back in the 60s, and so on our black and white televisions, we watched every time there was a rocket launch and every time somebody went to space. And ultimately, when we got into the moon program, every time there was a moon landing. And my generation of astronauts was captivated as children by that. And I thought, I want to do that. Well, that was not a career choice for children of the 60s, particularly women of the 60s. But I thought, eventually, they'll get over that. And, and on I went. 
Uh, astronauts were men, so that was out. Astronauts were military pilots, so I learned to fly, actually, before I learned to drive. They were engineers, so when I got out of high school, I went to college and got an engineering degree. What and the rest it? is kind of history. What was it like being a female astronaut in a mostly male-dominated career? You know, I didn't think of myself, and I still don't think of myself as a female astronaut. I think of myself as an astronaut who happens to be female, and it's a different mindset in when you think about that. So I was hired to do the job. I trained with all my other fellow astronauts, both men and women, and I... I'm a small person, so in space there are certain things that I can do better than a large person can, but being a woman has nothing to do with my ability to do the job. Having been in space, what was the solar eclipse like for you? How would it compare to someone who hasn't been in space before? You know, I don't know that there's any way that I can say my experience was different. If I, if I feel if the vibe of the crowd here during the eclipse, it was astounded, totally astounded. And, and I felt the same way. And whether I had been to space certainly didn't, didn't uh, diminish the experience in any way. So, Marcia, if I may ask you a question, um, this is something that I ask sure. every astronaut I have a chance to meet, um, because I can't get myself in the headscape of being in space and not freaking out, sort of like, you know, the fear of deep water. So I want to <laughs> know if you were on an EVA or even just kind of looking out the window, if you ever had that moment when you sort of looked down at the Earth and realized, oh, my God, I'm going 17 and a half thousand miles an hour and I'm 250 miles above Earth and air that I can breathe. Did you ever have that moment of, what am I doing right now? <laughs> um, no, I'll tell you the moment that I did have. Um, I had seen pictures that people had taken from space. I had, of course, spoken to people, everybody who had been to space. I was training with them. I was working with them every day. And so going to space was more of a technical thing for me, I thought, until I eventually got to orbit and looked down on the planet. and. Then there's a little voice in the back of your head that says, we're not in Kansas anymore, Toto. You know, it's the whole idea that I am off the planet. I used to leave a recording on my phone when I left that said, hi, it's Marsha. I'm off the planet right now, but leave a message and I'll call you back. And there'd be hundreds of people who called me and didn't leave a message just to hear my recording because I was off the planet. Who says that? Off the planet. That's absolutely wild. I mean, it has to have been an incredible experience. Um, and of course, like you said, it's, it's a human thing. You're, you're training and it's technical, but then you have that human moment. Is there one sort of human moment in either in your training or in space that sort of stands out as, yes, it's technical, but ultimately we're just people doing an amazing thing? I, I think every astronaut probably has that moment where they realize they are in space. Um, on my first flight, um, I was sitting, I was on the flight deck and I was sitting next to another first time flyer and we got to orbit and the engines quit and, and everything was working fine. And we usually, we went to orbit in the space shuttle upside down basically so that the antennas could still talk to the ground. And so when you look up overhead, the earth was below you. And my crew member next to me was, you know, sort of getting the whole feel of suddenly being weightless and, you know, swallowing a little bit like this. And I nudged him and I said, look up. And he looks up and here is this black of space and blue of the planet with the white on it and, and really no other colors there. And he just said, oh my. And that is a moment, you know, when you realize you have actually done this thing. That's amazing, amazing. And it's so, I have to say, every, no matter how many times I get to talk to an astronaut, it's always a huge thrill. So thank you for taking the time. Do you have anything else, Caroline? Just thank you so much. All right, awesome. Thank you. No, and, my um, pleasure to talk with you. Great. So I think uh, we might actually have a chance to see what's going on with eclipse feeds in other parts of the country. Like we've said, the eclipse is moving slowly from the, uh, the west coast to the east coast. Um, here we have a, I can't see what city this is. 
Oh, this is in Illinois, um, and this is a white light camera from NASA, Carbondale, Illinois. So this is a NASA feed um, in white light. Um, so it's not going to show you as much detail, um, but we see that we are getting close to, I believe we're getting close to totality in Carbondale. Um, so we, again, we're seeing other parts of the country, other people in other parts of the country, we are still seeing this beautiful um, crescent sun that is not something we're used to seeing. All right, we are going to take another look at the beautiful sun in Illinois as we are watching it slowly, the moon cover the most of the disk of the sun. It is just absolutely beautiful. So we're gonna stay on the shot for a minute. All right, we are going to go back into the field at Casper, Wyoming, back to Jeff, who has found a couple of gentlemen from China now living in LA, and they've traveled up to Casper, Wyoming, and this is the first time they have ever seen an eclipse with their own eyes. Jeff. Yes, uh, you are right. I am here with Ocean, who was born in Harbin, the city of Harbin, and Michael, who was born in Shanghai, and you were living in LA now, and you are in... Detroit. Detroit. And all right, so you guys have been friends for a while. You knew there was an eclipse coming. What brought you here? How did you, how long have you been coordinating this idea? And how'd you get here? Okay, uh, go ahead. <laughs> okay, all right. Well, I have an idea. It's a couple months early, actually. Um, I watch, uh, it's online, actually, Google online. Um, I find uh, there's a science magazine um, say there's a very Hard, um, really like uh, 395 years of time mm -hmm. in a local where you stay, country you can see uh, the eclipse uh, in your uh, town. Right. So, when th I just have an idea at the time. I think about it. I probably fly to Mi uh, Michigan somewhere or Illinois because my friends are there. So I want to nearby maybe Missouri somewhere. Mm -hmm. I didn't check detail, but later on, uh, more close to today. So the last month, I feel more serious and check more things. Uh, we make a decision really like uh, seven days early. Yeah. And you said you flew into Denver and then drove up here. Yeah. 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 And are you are you just sleeping in your car? Were you able? Oh to no, get a, we you have we, a hotel. We booked three different hotels in three different uh, cities Very because good, of the, the closer to the uh, Casper. Yeah. The most crowded hotel is. So we exactly. actually booked in the yeah. up north. 
in the Buffalo of Wyoming. Yeah. Last night. Not yet. Yes. Not Buffalo. No, no, no. That would have been a bigger schlep. No. To get here. <laughs> there it is, of course. Yeah. So you both have now. You are veterans of having seen an eclipse. There aren't. You know, not everyone gets to say that. Luckily. What yeah. was the experience like for you? Well, it's amazing, actually. Uh, it's unbelievable, unforgettable. An impression very strong. Even though I know, I check on YouTube and online videos how it looks like, you know, the people showing different pictures or the clips, footage, things. But still cannot be the real things, actually. Um, this is my second time. The first time uh, when I was in elementary school, um, yeah. fourth grade, grade four, um, that is the partial. And where uh, was that? In my town, Harbin City. Harbin. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a partial actually. Yeah. Um, I heard about that's amazing for um, the circle one, ring one, yeah. where the annular. Yeah, the totally. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but actually, cannot feel like today. It's yeah. it's unbelievable. Totally. Especially it's gradually, you know, disappeared. Right. It's a uh, yeah. Wow. And yeah. what about you? Have you seen one? In yeah, like uh, my friend Ocean, I saw once when I was in elementary school back in uh -huh. Shanghai. But that was uh, the annual one. That was the annual. Yeah, this yeah. was really my first time. Right. And it was really once in in lifetime. Yeah. It was just speechless. Yeah. Earlier, the CCTV here uh -huh. was doing the interview with us as well. At that moment, I just I couldn't say anything. I know. Isn't that it's absolutely true? You're affected at a very emotional level. And you sort of need time to come back down from it. Yeah. Wow. Okay, so now the question with eclipses is once you get bitten by the bug, then you need a constant eclipse fix. Do you think <laughs> you, you guys are going to become yeah. eclipse chasers? Uh, I think it would be fine. Yeah. yeah. You, know, you think <laughs> so? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Maybe once is good. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you guys very much. very much. I hope you have a great, easy trip back, and it's a pleasure getting to chat with thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much. Yeah. Day. Thank you so much, and back to you, Amy. Great. Thanks so much, Jeff. It's amazing. The more people you talk to and kind of capture that excitement, the more jealous I am that I didn't get to be there, too. Um, and speaking of being jealous of somebody being in the eclipse totality path, where I am not, uh, we are going to uh, Carbondale, Illinois, where we have a time editor, uh, Rebecca Katzman, on the phone. She's traveled from New York to go to cloudy Carbondale. So we're going to catch up with Rebecca and see what's going on. Uh, Rebecca, do we have you on the phone? Yes. Hey, how's it going? Good. How are things in Carbondale? Okay, so totality ended maybe 10, 15 minutes ago, and the experience itself was just unreal. It was amazing. Um, the crazy thing about it was just the weather. So it's been incredibly hot and humid here and hardly a cloud in the sky all day. And then maybe 20 minutes or so before totality, um, a huge dark cloud went right in front of the sun to the point that you couldn't even see a thing through your eclipse glasses. And then, um, like, miraculously, when actually totality hit, um, there was about 10 seconds in the beginning and 10 seconds in the very end where you could see, um, where you could see what was going on. Was it cloudy other than that? We just got a bit of a feed from Carbondale and we couldn't really see anything because it was sort of there, wispy clouds, and then, right, of course, for looking through a solar filter, it just went black because the clouds covered through the sun. This is, this is our current shot of Carbondale that we've got up on the screen and it's just black because, of course, we're looking through a solar filter that can't see any scattered sunlight, just black. So, um, yeah, did that dampen anybody's excitement? I mean, was there kind of nerves or did it... How, how was you it know the what? weather and everyone's mood? So I spoke to a few people after um, that happened, and um, the general sense I'm getting is that people were definitely bummed and disappointed that it was just only that um, short, short, tiny um, glimpse of totality. But um, the just what I've been hearing is that people are just super... Super. I mean, the energy was still great, and people, like, right when totality hit, people started doing the wave. Um, and so I get the what I'm kind of gathering is that um, people were just were definitely disappointed, but uh, but all in all, just excited to like be part of this experience. I mean, the it definitely did get really dark um, here, and you could like right before totality, it looked like all in all directions, it looked like the, there was like a sunset. 
and you could see some stars and stuff. Um, so that was really neat. That's absolutely wild. Um, so one thing I'm kind of curious about, um, we've been talking to Jeff and kind of seeing the crowd very quickly dissipating um, in Casper. So once the eclipse was done, was it sort of like a, well, I guess that's that, and just rolling up the blankets and packing up in the car? Are people lingering, or was that sort of like shows over, going home? You know, there there definitely is still a scattering of people that are lingering, but it did seem like people are just kind of shoveling out of the stadium um, after the eclipse ended. I wonder if that might have had to do with just, like, traffic reports and reports um, just that it's going to be – it would be tough to get in and it's going to be tough to get out just because of the size of the town. But Right. Did you – how was the trip in and how do you expect the trip out is going to be for you? Did you hit a lot of traffic? I saw pictures, just my friends who have gone to various locations, they were just backed up. Someone said that um, – I forget what town he was in, but – that this tiny little town in the path of totality had more traffic than downtown LA. Um, did you experience any like insane throngs of people or was it eh, sort of okay? So for me, the trip in was actually just completely fine um, because we, we were worried um, about what the traffic could be like. So we left at like 4 a.m. and hardly hit another car. Um, but, and I think leaving will be okay too. Um, I don't have an exact, I didn't get the exact number of how many people ended up showing up uh, yet to Carbondale, but I think my hunch is that it's around what they expected or maybe even slightly lower, but I'm not sure of that yet. Right. So my final question, um, since you were there on the ground, did you have a sense of how many sort of viewers were families that had brought their kids to see it? Was there a lot of children there? Or was it mostly sort of grown people that are lifelong space nerds? I'm trying to figure out how many people we converted into loving science today. A ton, a ton of kids here. Awesome. A lot of, actually, in a lot of instances, kids who are the space nerds who brought their parents along. Um, so definitely lots of kids here, lots of young people here. And yeah. Awesome. Okay, well, I'm not sure if we st have, still have Rebecca on the phone. Rebecca, did we lose you? Oh, no, still here. Okay, great. Um, I think we cut out there. Well, um, I won't, won't keep you any longer. I wish you luck not hitting too much traffic on your way back. And thank you so much for taking some time and filling us in with what's going on on the ground out, out, out there. Thank you. All right, so we are going to take another look at what's going on in Wyoming. Of course, we've had totality. We are just, oh, we're just seeing the moon leaving the disk of the sun now. It's almost completely over. That's so sad. Um, and we can still see some really neat sunspots right in the middle. And, of course, uh, more on the ground slash on the ground in Wyoming, we are back with Jeff. Um, Jeff, do we have you on the phone slash on the line? Uh, I, am, I am here, yes, and I'm here with uh, Benny Ditbrenner, 16 years old, and I won't say Benny has uh, powerful friends, but the gentleman behind the camera uh, is named Ian Ditbrenner, and he keeps calling him dad, so I'm going to assume <laughs> they know each other. Um, in any event, Benny has been more than just a family member here to spectate. Uh, you've done a lot of great work today. You've done a lot of photography work. You were here yesterday during our windstorm, and you caught a lot of debris. So thank you for your service. Um, and can you tell us a little bit about the work you're doing with your, your the photographic work you've done today? Well, I um, set up a tripod a couple hours before the eclipse. Um, I, had, I have two adapters here because it's a weird setup. Um, it's an 80 to 400. Um, on a Sony A6300, and I um, put the, uh, I borrowed an uh, ND14 filter from uh, one of the crew members here, and set it up on my tripod and, and waited until the eclipse. <laughs> so for someone like me, for whom photography means hit the camera icon on my iPhone and then push and don't screw it up, mm -hmm. um, that is, is a little above my pay grade, but tell me what you're getting. Tell me the quality of images you think you're getting and and how you're going to process these now that you have them. Well, the quality is very good for being what it is, um, but it's extremely hard to focus, and it's because it's so long and it doesn't have uh, uh, image stabilization, you have to put it on a timer to take a picture 
and anytime there's a wind gust, it ruins your picture. So it it's hard and manual mode because the light keeps changing. It's just it was difficult to say the least. But it was worth it, I imagine, Completely to be here worth it. for it. We took an RV two days to get here. A lot of a lot of hardship. It was completely worth it in the end. Yeah. And do you think you will, uh, this may have given you the space bug, not just to photograph eclipses, but other celestial phenomena. Do you think you'll be out on a lot of dark nights now? Yes, I am extremely interested in astronomy, not astrology, <laughs> astronomy. Right. Um, and this was a great opportunity for me to get my on an eclipse. Right. And Were you prepared emotionally for what you saw today? Did you have a sense of what it was going to be like? I was not emotionally prepared. I had a sense of what it was going to be like from videos and GIFs I've seen before, but that didn't compare to anything in, to see it in real life. It was emotionally... I was... Emotionally unstable. I, I didn't know whether to feel happy or scared or or some other emotion that I've never actually felt before. It was incredible. And to get these pictures and look at them later and be reminded of those feelings is fantastic. I totally agree. And I would say after all these years of following eclipses, uh, the description, I was happy, scared, and didn't know what feelings I was feeling. That's about the best description I've ever heard of what an eclipse makes you feel like. So you probably have a lot of processing work to do, and I'm looking at the guy behind the camera, and I think he has a job for you here or there. <laughs> so thank you for being here, and Amy, back to you in New York. Great. Thanks so much, Jeff. That's an incredible description from someone so young to be photographing the eclipse. This is amazing. So again, we are back uh, with our view of the moon just leaving the disk of the sun in Castro, Wyoming. Again, we can still see a few sunspots and we can see it's getting a little bit cloudy. That's what that kind of haze moving over the sun is. So we, I think we might have gotten really lucky to have that perfect clear sky at the moment of totality for the beautiful shot. But even still, seeing the moon leaving the sun right now is just just absolutely stunning to look at.
All right, we have a very interesting person on the phone right now. We have uh, time writer Zeke Miller, who actually, uh, Zeke, I hear that you tried to take a flight to time it so that you'd be able to see the eclipse from the air? <laughs> Yeah, no, we, 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 we worked on that uh, planning, but then we realized, you know, it's kind of given the, given the high wing aircraft, we wouldn't be able to see it. So we are on the ground here in uh, Greenville, uh, South Carolina, Greenville Downtown Airport, where there are probably about 200 air, uh, aircraft that have flown in just to see the eclipse. We just got out of the totality about wow. five, six minutes ago. So you were able to see it. Did you see it in the air at all, or did you see it from the ground once you landed? Uh, we saw it from the ground once we landed. Uh, we're about to take off now. If you, in, in the background, you might hear some of the uh, uh, propellers warming up on, a, on, a, on a the aircraft around me. Uh, we're going to be uh, taking off with it behind us as we fly back to Washington. Oh, wait. Did you, did you only fly into South Carolina to see the eclipse from a plane, and now you're flying right back to D.C.? Yep. Uh, I'm going back <laughs> to my day job tonight covering the White House. That is dedication. That is awesome. So uh, it sort of worked, but you got to see totality. Uh, would you do it again? Would you do the eclipse flight again? I can see that. Hear the I propeller mean, now. <laughs> oh yeah, no, I, I would. I, I would do it in a heartbeat. It was one of the most amazing things I've ever seen. I mean, you know, look, it, it, we were able to get some some, some pretty great photos, and uh, just you know, it, it was astonishing just how, with even the tiniest sliver of sunlight remaining, it, it looked like daylight. Uh, and then for a moment, the like the runway lights and all the uh, airfield lights turned on as though it was nighttime, and then back into daylight. That's wild. How many people were you with doing this eclipse flight? Was it, did you have a group with you? Uh, I'm, I'm here with my colleague, Chris Wilson, uh, who's Times Director of uh, Data Journals, and he came down for the flight and helped him be, uh, document it while I'm flying the plane. And then uh, I brought my brother along too. So we've had uh, quite the adventure so far today. Nice. And was this the first time you've been able to see an eclipse or done an eclipse trip? This is, I mean, a unique oh, one. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the unique one, yeah. The first time I've, I've ever even thought to do anything like this. So it's been kind of a amazing experience. Well, uh, awesome. I mean, thanks. I, I know you have to take off literally in um, very quickly, so I'll, I'll let you go. Thank you so much for joining us quickly on the phone and filling us in a little bit on what your day was like for Eclipse Day. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Cheers. Safe travels. All right, we are going to go uh, back to Casper, Wyoming, and we're going to catch up with Jeff. Um, I believe it looks like everything was kind of wrapping up there. So, Jeff, what uh, what's going on where you are? Uh, well, think things are quieting down now. We're seeing uh, a lot of the folks who were here dispersing. We're seeing some picnics being rolled out. We're seeing a lot of vans pulling out of the parking lot. So the mini Woodstock here in, uh, in Casper, Wyoming is now beginning to disperse. And we're just left with sort of some final thoughts that the experience left us thinking about. And some of them come from Marsha who has and has always had some strong feelings about where NASA is today and where NASA should be going in the future. And a day like this that focuses us on the splendor of space is a, a good time to look at that. So Marcia, what are you thinking about what you would like to see NASA do? When I was wanting to be an astronaut as a child and we were landing on the moon, I, I was thinking all the cool stuff is going to be done before I, before I get old enough to do that. And I went to work for NASA and I worked for 37 years for NASA and the cool stuff that you would imagine as technology advances hasn't been done. Where in any other technological field have we continued to use the same technology we're using 50 years later? So I'm hoping that maybe this solar eclipse has served as some inspirational sort of um, jump start for people to say, well, let's go see all the things that are out there in the stars, which is what I wanted to do and many other astronauts wanted to do as a child. And once there is a will, there is always a way. That's right. And there is money and there is political consensus when people agree that this is something we're going to do. You know, I've said before that of all the millions of words John Kennedy spoke in his career, the most powerful one was a single verb, and that verb was choose, when he said, we choose to go to the moon. We didn't have to go to the moon. No one had dared us to go to the moon. We chose to go to the moon because we are a crazy, ambitious, idiosyncratic species that cannot stand on one crest of one hill without wanting to get over to the other crest of the other hill. And I'd like to think that something like today can bring back that sense. Right. So 
uh, I am going to toss to Amy, and uh, I'm going to say that uh, a final thought. I don't know where you, Amy, will be on September 18th, 2024, but there is another uh, total American eclipse coming. So if you're game, I'm game. We'll figure out the next venue, and let's start booking flights. I am definitely game. <laughs> um, Jeff, Marsha, thank you so much for being on the ground with us in Casper all day. It's been amazing to experience it um, through your eyes, being on the ground, seeing everybody there, experiencing the, the darkness, the chills, everything, and uh, definitely makes me want to be in the field for the next eclipse. So um, I'm gonna have to make that happen. So yeah, I think I think you guys are wrapping up, but I think we're wrapping up out here too. Have a uh, safe travels home, both of you. and. Uh, Everyone for wa who, who's been watching, thank you so much for joining us for this. This has been an incredible day. Even um, for me, watching it on a monitor, um, not being in the field was still an incredible experience. I was amazed personally to be able to see the corona that clearly. Um, seeing pictures for some reason feels different than seeing a live video feed. You know, you can't you can't take that and, and you can't enhance it um, live and being able to see that those spots that are flares just pop up. I mean, it's really, really incredible stuff. So on, on that note, we're going to end. We're going to look at that shot of totality from Casper, Wyoming one last time. Again, thank you everyone for joining us and spending the last three hours with us as we as we've crossed the country and spoken to people around the country um, looking at the great American solar eclipse.